We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andrew and I'm here with... Rob H., this is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. And I know everyone's talking about Childish Gambino's latest music video, and it is quite cool, but I want to know if beauty can come out of ashes, Tom. Can I beauty come out of ashes? Have, I have seen people talking about it. I have not watched the video yet. <laughs> I will say that I have, I have, I back when no one had ever heard of him, when he was just the guy on community and then no one yep. knew, you know, when he still called himself Sick Boy, which was pre oh, yeah. prior to wow, Charles Gambino, yeah. Gambino yeah. I knew who he was. But that being said, uh, I have not seen this video, but I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's great. It's something. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not going to claim I understood all the lyrics. I'm going to have to read them because I, 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 I couldn't make them all out. Uh, and, and they're important. They're important to what's going on. So, yes. I, I, I'm go I'll watch it right after the All show. right. I'll watch it right after the show. Do you know what the Beauty Coming Out of Ashes reference is? <laughs> that's that's no. the very awesome Celine Dion song that they recorded for Deadpool 2. <laughs> Oh, an excellent video to go along with it. I have not seen that either. I oh, have, it's worth it. it, it I, 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 I tread a very fine line between mm -hmm. trailers and spoilers. Yes, where I, I am very, I'm very like I just read today something about the Avengers that sort of kind of spoiled something for me. And oh, it was it's just in the head. I don't know how you can avoid it, dude. It's it's very hard. Yeah, but that means that very... stuff like this, like, like, oh, you got to see this video. I'm like, ah, nah, nah. No, I can't this was, I can't, no, take, I can't take the chance. There could no be something about Deadpool in the, 2. In the music video for Deadpool 2, it's like it's like the Bob Ross painting one. I, I really don't think that's actually in the movie. Okay. So, yeah. That being said, yeah. I'm just saying that that's how I live my life now because I, my kids yep. are like, oh, are we going to go see Avengers? I'm like, nope. <laughs> Not doing it. All right. So. That being said, we did watch, uh, had movie night this weekend with my kids and we watched Maleficent, which was oh, yeah. fantastic. I love that movie. How d that movie got past whatever the higher ups are at Disney, uh -huh. how that movie got made. Uh, didn't that kind of start the whole live action Disney remake thing off? It did, but how? Yeah. How did that movie get made? I mean, you look at it, it's like a, a, a no trigger warnings or, or maybe trigger, <laughs> I don't know, but it's like a, a complete rape allegory. The whole thing is a yeah. metaphor for for rape and I'm like this is amazing that they got this movie made. I'm so happy, but Disney made this movie. <laughs> How they, did they, Disney make this movie? They just but, straight up started remaking their cartoons after, so somebody clued in eventually. Yeah, I, somebody over there is doing something right. That's all I gotta say. I'm glad they're <laughs> doing it. I, I think I, it, it, I, I gotta believe that. Uh, what's her name being the lead is Angelina like, Jolie. Angelina Jolie was like, well, this is the movie she wants to make. Well, okay, I yep. guess we have to make it. Yeah, <laughs> that's what you mean. All, all right, this is here. this is not talk about movies. Nope. This is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. Get your questions answered. All you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. You go to www.avrant.com. You can leave us a comment there, facebook.com slash avrantpodcast, youtube.com slash avrant. All of these things you can leave comments at, only YouTube where you will get ignored. Every place else, yeah. we pay very close attention to you. If you would like to contact Text us directly. It's Rob at avrent.com. His Twitter is at First Reflect. I'm Tom at avrent.com. My Twitter is at avrent underscore Tom. But it, just email question at avrent. That's really question what you want to do. Question at avrent. That's, that's where you want to you send your yeah. communication. You yes. Yeah. If you send it to just me, and I don't know this, that you haven't sent it to question <laughs> at avrent, then it will not get answered mostly because I will look at it and say, oh, I can't wait to answer this on the podcast, yeah. which will which will show up when Rob puts it onto the list. But that's well. I would have no idea. You have no idea. Then somebody will be. You never answer my question. You are a bunch of liars. Uh, no, we're not. We just you know in the fall directions. Um, 
piece of news, personal news. I am, uh, we have my wife and I, I guess, have invested in a mobile climbing wall. Uh huh. And we are starting a new mobile climbing wall business here in St. Petersburg, Florida. So that's happening. I, I don't have the wall yet. I don't even okay. have the name of the business yet. That that, that was all, that was my two uh, my number one to do today. And instead, of what my number one to do was, I have a kid who's throwing up, so I'm going to deal with that nonsense. So then that now now tomorrow my number one to do is to figure out a name for the business. And Tom's then, traveling vomitorium. No, yeah. well, yeah. <laughs> I don't think that'll sell. Plus it doesn't really convey that it is a mobile climbing wall. So that's an exciting new step in my life and I'll be uh, focusing more and more on that as time goes on, which <laughs> it will actually open up more time for this podcast, I believe. <laughs> in the end, I will have more time for this podcast. That's my theory. Best laid plans. Yes. So uh, we're going to start our podcast as we always do, thanking our listeners of the week. To become a listener of the week, all you have to do is support the podcast in some way. One way you can do that is going to www.avrent.com and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link. This sends you to a PayPal donation site where you can use your PayPal account or a credit card where PayPal will take all your digits and do whatever they do with them and then give us some of the money. Mm -hmm. So we want to thank Miguel and Chris for donating this last week. Uh, thank you very much. Those monies will go into our coffers to help pay for all of our stuffs. Yeah, Miguel, Chris, thank you very much for those donations. And if you haven't been paying attention, I hope you have. There's been a donation pledge that was started by an anonymous listener a couple of weeks back. But it kind of keeps snowballing. So mm. th this is the week, May 7th through May 14th. Is the this week is the week? If you are hearing I this, I feel like we should have gone two weeks now that I'm thinking about it because we one week seems very short sighted. Like people are gonna miss their opportunity. Maybe I would because I fall behind on things. But anyways, let's yes. hope. So we had anonymous, yep. and then last week James C, one of our listeners, uh, joined the original anonymous donor. So both of them have pledged a hundred dollars in matching contributions. So if we get through a hundred, if we get a hundred dollars worth of contributions. Our anonymous listener will give us an extra hundred dollars on top of it. If we uh -huh. get another hundred on top of that, we will then get another hundred dollars from James, who will match that, which will give us up to now four hundred dollars for those of you that are good at math. That would be the total, yes. But then we got another one. Yeah. Who is this other one? Deepon. Deepon. Sorry. Deepon. Yeah. I'm very confused by all these words. There's so many words here. <laughs> Deepon now wants to add another $100 matching. So that means if we get $300, we'll get $600. What will yeah. we do with that money? I will write a $300 check to Rob. <laughs> then. Woohoo. Woohoo. Uh, then we, I will make it rain. No, I will, uh, I will put that money probably to help pay for the new computer that I'm going to end up having to buy for my son eventually anyways. So. <laughs> We are going to be doing. We're going to be doing that. So that yes, that we are going to take that money and put it back into the podcast. That's what we know. I give money to Rob for Rob to do buy equipment or do whatever he does. Get a new shoulder. Get something titanium this eh. time. You know what? I'll just take the steroid injection. They never gave it to me. I'll take that. Yeah, get one of those. You go go be like Arnold now. You are so big and strong. <laughs> I don't think it's that type of steroid. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I'm going to give you that one, too. So uh, thank you very much to uh, Deepon and to all of our, and to James and to Anonymous for doing this. And if uh, you are hearing this during the week of May 7th and May 4th, to May 14th, 2018, though, honestly, if you're hearing it at all and you feel like donating, feel free. We would this is the week to do it. <laughs> Chuck us a dollar. Thank we you. also want to thank our patrons over at Patreon. Patreon is a service where you give uh, your information and then once a month they take a, something out of your account and they give it part of it to us uh -huh. so it's a monthly subscription thing so once a month it's a minimum of a dollar i believe so that it is uh, we have 59 now patrons yeah. we're trying to break that 60 the big six That'd zero cool. when we break 60 you know what's going to happen we will have 60 we sure <laughs> that's, will we'll that's have what an we're going to do again <laughs> we won't we don't do like stretch go goals or any of that stuff. we really don't <laughs> we, we, yeah that that patreon <laughs> page is pretty way. bare bones but that's patreon.com slash av rant podcast and thank you very much to our 59 now patrons we do appreciate everybody that supports the podcast in any way mm -hmm. and we do thank you all uh but we i mean we were doing this podcast before anybody gave us any money we're going to keep probably doing it afterwards at some point one of us is going to i think at i believe at this point it's a staring contest like is you it? and I are just staring at each other going, who's going to quit? Who's going to quit? That's not now, the way I felt, but geez, that's, I'm just know, telling, I I'm just telling you. I mean, I mean, I don't think that either one of us wants to quit, but I think at some point one of us is going to go, wow, he's really, been, he's really hanging in there. <laughs> he hasn't complained at all. 
I mean, I'm only doing, doing it like what five years longer than you too. So you know, I got mm-hmm. that on you too. Hey, uh, if you can't support the podcast financially, we totally understand. Uh, if you can figure out some way to support us in another way, just let us know what you did, and we will mention you. Aiden, for example, bought us bought a second rhythmic FV15 HP subwoofer and let them know it was because of us. And Miguel talked to us up to accessories for less and for Oppo, who I think was just probably an answer machine when he bought his uh, Marantz SR8012 receiver and UDP203 HD, uh, UHD, whatever, Ultra HD Blu-ray player from Oppo. He says that he was listening to, uh, that listening to AV Rent took him from an older Yamaha receiver with a Bose 5.1 cube speaker system to his new Marantz with an Adcom amp that he found on sale on Craigslist, powering ELAC Unify speakers. He's not done yet. He'll be getting a new TV a projector, dual subs, and more speakers to complete his 7.2.4 setup. And sir, um, I am both very excited for you and very sorry for what we have done we, to your poor life. We have lightened <laughs> Miguel's wallet, that, that, that is, is for true. sure. Plus that he donated, true. so hey, that's that's a lot of money going out there. But congrats, Miguel, Miguel, on your purchases. Those are awesome. And Aiden, congrats on getting that second rhythmic subwoofer. All very nice stuff. Yeah. In the news, could it be the return of Ankyo as a price barrier breaking brand? You like that alliteration? Headline. Yeah, it's real easy to say, too, when it's 9 o'clock at night and I'm tired. The newly announced TXNR787 has nine amps built in for 5.2.4 Atmos. So it's not 7.2.2? You can't do 7? You can do 7.2.2. You just cannot do 7.2.4. It talks about it. Nine speakers total. Okay. There's also Chromecast built in and DTS PlayFi, which I do like quite a bit, mm-hmm. plus THX Select 2 certification, which I don't care about at all. Best of all, the MSRP is $799. They must have really sliced the prices on that THX certification. Yeah. But there are no pre-outs except for the subwoofers. None? Not even like stereo? Not there are right? no pre out Well, there's zone two, I guess, but that doesn't really help you in your main zone. So there is no expanding this TXNR 787 to 11 speakers. It is okay. nine speakers, and you must power all nine of those speakers from the TX 787. That's itself. okay. That's okay. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, it's it's it, what a lot of people will want, and that's right. a very attractive price point. It is. Well, all we have to know now is uh, two things. One, uh, how does it perform under load with all those yeah. speakers being played at the same time? And two, does it catch on fire? We need those two things answered. That has not been an Ankyo problem for ages, so we, we should not hold I that know. against them. I should not hold it against them. I will. But I should not. But I'm going to. Some comments from our listeners. Nathan wrote to Dolby directly to ask if they would ever change the Dolby Surround Up mixer to allow it to use front right, wide speakers. They replied that they are studying the subject but have no further insights to communicate at this time. Mm-hmm. Just code for no. Leave us alone. <laughs> We're not doing it. That's what that's what that means. Well, maybe if we keep on bugging them, who knows? Yeah, you bug them. I am bugging them. Yeah. Uh, Lee suggested that uh, that I, probably in particular, or uh-huh. anybody who's interested, could use the Run P app. Run P R U N P E E. Mm. That tells you the best time during any movie to run to the bathroom without missing anything too important. Lee also says that Atomic Blonde has the best Atmos soundtrack he's heard in his home theater so far. I Where he watched, can pause the movie. Yeah, he can. The, uh, <laughs> I watched Atomic Blonde. That movie is not good. I, I wasn't a particularly big fan of it. But uh, it, demo material, I can ab- absolutely believe that. I saw oh, it in the I theater. I haven't bothered to watch it at home. So Where did I see this? I don't remember where I saw this. I think I streamed it off of something. Could be. But I did not pay for it. That is for sure. Uh-huh. But it was. I was like, wow, this movie's really kind of, kind of, kind of dumb. Like real dumb. Like <laughs> stupid. But whatever. That's fine. It's got a good. But how does the Run P app tell you when to go? I think you just read it ahead of time. I didn't really look. I don't know. Because, I mean, if I check my phone, then uh, I'm just one of those guys. Yeah, well, I'm sure it can vibrate or something. I don't know. I haven't really looked into it. All right. Or you can do my solution, which is wait till it comes out on video. Robert just wanted to share his approval for the Van- Vanitu Transparent One self-powered speakers. He's gone through quite a few computer speakers for his near-field listening setup. Uh, when he went from Bose Cubes to Audio Engine A2s, it really opened up his appreciation for good sound and gave him the upgrade bug big time. But when he replaces A2s with the larger A5 Pluses, he was a little put off with their seemingly tipped up 
treble that couldn't be curtailed with EQs or settings. While he knows there are a lot of other variables in, in the audio setup, he thinks the Vanna 2 speakers are a real cut above. He prefers them to the audio engines. So for anyone looking for self-powered speakers, he definitely thinks they're worth the audition. I cannot see them in this picture. Are they the black boxes? They are the black boxes to either side of his monitor. Okay, I still cannot see them. I mean, I see that there's black spaces, but that's it. I did go to somebody's house this weekend. Um, it was a... Okay, I was told it was a Cinco de Mayo party, okay. but uh, which I don't really care about. I don't celebrate Cinco de Mayo. I like margaritas any time of the year. It doesn't have to be on the 5th of May. But I was told it was not. It was a Cinco de Derby party, which was about the Kentucky Derby, and oh, we were okay. all supposed to wear hats, which I did not uh, wear a hat. Yes, yes. No one in my family wore a hat, and but they still served uh, Mexican food, which was okay. But... They had uh, B and W little speakers, like they were. Oh yeah, uh, but it was matched with an energy base cube thing. Okay, next to a TV that was far too small, and the <laughs> sound. I don't know what was going. On. I don't think that the sound was going through. I hope the sound wasn't going through the B and Ws because it oh. was atrocious. <laughs> like it was real bad. It was. I was like, I can hear what is happening, and that is about it. Mm. That, I mean, that is all I can say about this. That that it is conveying sound that is clearly related to the picture I am watching. But other than that, wow. I mean, it just it sounded like it was coming through cellophane. I mean, that's huh. how that's how bad that was. So I'm hoping the sound was coming from the TV. But anyways, that just I just remember staring at you know 30 people in a room staring at a TV that is like 32 inches across. I'm like, uh, <sighs> well, the Vanda Two transparent ones that we were talking about, they're five hundred dollars a pair normally, yep. and you can find them at discount for four fifty a pair. Uh, so yeah, so they're in the same sort of price range as the Audio Engine A5s. But uh, according to Robert, he likes them better. We had another listener who was talking about the Vanitus before, so it's it's not a brand that I'm familiar with personally, but uh, I, I can believe that someone out there made some good self-powered speakers for 500 bucks. so yeah. give them a try. I used to like the Swans that I had a yeah. million years ago. Uh, Gene liked his enough that he actually uh, hooked him up to his electronic drum set and was using them to, okay. to recreate that, which, you know, if you want something musical, what's more musical than electronic drums, I guess, I suppose. Theoretically, I guess any other instrument that actually makes notes would qualify. Let's get to the questions. Let's shall. Earl. Earl just received his dual SVS SB16 subs. There's a sealed box 16 inch driver subs from SVS. He'll be positioning them at the opposite ends of his room. What should he do in terms of power protection? He knows we've said just to plug, plug subwoofers and high-end amplifiers straight into the wall, but he'd feel more comfortable if he had some sort of surge protection between these expensive subs and the outlet. For the sub at the front of the room, he already has a monster power, don't use that, conditioner for the rest of his equipment, but he doubts it's the best idea to plug the subwoofer into that. That is true. You are correct. So, so he's willing to buy two separate surge protectors. He just doesn't want to overspend, but he also doesn't want anything that will choke the electrical current, so what do we recommend? Uh, Rob's going to tell you, but it is, there is a, it's almost like a, is it a strip that's from APC? It is. It is a strip, right? Yeah, but it yeah. has, it, it allows everything through, but it has like, surge protection on I mean it, it it really is just a surge protector it's just that it allows the full 15 amps through uh, yeah. unlike many surge protectors that choke it off at 12 amps is very common yeah. so it is the APC P8V uh, you can find them right around 50 bucks so I don't think that's too expensive these are actually exactly what I plug my PC13 ultras into I have one on either side of the room so I got two of the P8Vs from APC and uh, that's that's what I use. I gotta be honest. As somebody who lives in Florida, where we have power outages on the regular, yep. I have taken the, the the precaution of plugging my subwoofers directly into the wall. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, so far, no problems. And I think fuses are a lot cheaper than fifty bucks. But Could that's be. Just me. He asks. Lastly, do the subs need a break-in period before running room correction? If so, how many hours and what content should be played? You should play. Uh, you should turn them on. We we need we need a fractional number if we're talking hours. <laughs> hours, that's right. I mean, I, okay. So there was a an article over at, at Audioholics many 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 moons ago by a guy who bought brand new drivers, like from the factory drivers, and tried to measure their break in, you know, yep. the differences in the objective measurements of what they played 
over time. And I think with subwoofers, was it five minutes or less? Oh, was it even that long? I, it might have been even less. I know it was like I, I thought it was in the seconds. Yeah. It's definitely in the seconds for like the tweeters and the mid range oh, yeah, and yeah, the woofers yeah. and stuff like well, that. Well, those, were, those like, were like not even a second. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I, I think that, that at the end of the article, like, well, if you play them for five minutes, you're absolutely 100% guaranteed that they okay. have whatever I, whatever the spider needs to do yeah. in there whatever possible things that could be worked out you're guaranteed so and what could you play doesn't matter pink noise <laughs> sweep i mean i Just, wouldn't play a single tone that might not matter. it doesn't move really it. matter you're yeah, good it probably doesn't matter it i'd probably just play some sweeps on repeat that's what i'd do I don't even think. Honestly, I, think I, I wouldn't even do that. I just, I, I just turn them on uh, and then do the, the, do Odyssey. Yeah. Let them I play mean, a, a little bit, and uh, and that's about it. No, we're we are we are not believers in break in because the objective data says uh, there's really no such. Well, can't say no such thing. There's like five seconds where there's a change. Yeah, it's like that first time the driver goes in and out. And that's like, yeah, okay. pretty much. Yeah. Everything's operating within param within the param. It's supposed to be operating within the parameters of what is. There should be no change within the driver. So if there's just, it's just nothing. Nick. Nick is playing a theater build, but he is debating whether he wants to include an equipment rack in the back corner or if he should just incorporate a place for the gear below his display. On the one hand, having a closet at the back would give him a nice clean look with no distractions from the screen at the front of the room. But on the other hand, he sometimes finds the front panel display of his gear to be useful, especially his receivers, and sometimes uh, sources don't automatically trigger his desired listening mode. So being able to see the front display instantly tells him which just an incoming signal is being used. What do we think? I think that there's a button on most remotes called Info, which will tell you that it was on my denon it does yeah it, yeah it will tell you that so programming in a button to give you that information on your screen whenever you're interested in it is probably preferable to putting all your gear up front just so that you can occasionally look over at a screen and the rest of the time be annoyed by it uh yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I, can, I can see the argument both ways because I, I like the convenience of being able to see my receiver's front panels today. Because, like, yes, yes, I can bring it up on screen if I needed to, but it is kind of convenient to just glance at it and be like, yes, it is actually playing in Dolby Surround Up Mixer or DTS Neural X Up Mixer dude, that I want to use right now. Or if you're going to put it at the back of your room, just put a glass thing in front of it so that you can turn around and look at it. And that way it never bothers you other than that one moment when you're turning around to look at it. You know what I mean? It, it, I 100% agree. Uh, now, my advice is not at all what I do. Now, my, okay. <laughs> my gear is up front. Yep. And because that's where my my closet is, and that's where it ends up ended up anyways. So I just went by convenience. But I never press the button to see what it is. I always like kind of scoot forward in the chair and uh -huh. look for it. Like, is that is it playing the right stuff? I always do that. So I am a hundred percent behind this guy and what he's asking. But the real the real honest solution is use your Harmony remote. Make a specific button that just is for this and then you can do it yeah i would say like I, i'm not absolutely sure whether he said screen so i'm thinking this is a projection setup right that's why so I think too. if that's the case if this is a projection setup i'm more inclined to hide all your gear at the back of the room and have no distractions at the front of the room yeah. if it's a flat panel i don't care as much i'm i'm more likely to say i'm willing to have equipment up front uh, along with a flat panel because that that isn't going to like you know ruin the contrast of your image in any way um it's not going to be distracting from your huge projection screen if it isn't a projection screen so i'm al i'm almost it depends on what screen you have but uh, right assuming it's projection i i'm going to vote you put it at the back of the room yeah if he wants a nice clean look he should put it at the back of the room and just yeah. have the button i mean that's what it comes down to yeah. but I'm not a practice what you preach kind of guy in this situation. <laughs> Mark. Mark is trying to sort through some confusion about HDR and projectors and using the Opus player's HDR to SDR conversion options with its target luminance slider. I already don't understand anything we're talking about, but let's go. His projector is calibrated for about 50 nits, 15 foot Lamberts, for peak white uh, for SDR content. Okay, so he's, he's calibrated for SDR for 50 nits. The, this is the standard as far as he knows, but SDR is mastered for 100 nits on flat panels, correct? Yes, that is correct. 
So the standard is to render 100 nit content at 50 nits for projectors. Does he have that correct? Yes, you do. That is yep. correct. Yeah. Yep. So in a, in a full-size movie theater, they're aiming for between 14 and 16 foot Lamberts, which uh, translates to around 50 nits, 40 to right. 60 nits or so. Uh, so yeah, that is that is the target. And uh, yeah, SDR content is mastered to 100 nits. So you got a signal that contains information up to 100 nits uh, being fit within... Uh, 50 nits as the max for the projector but there is a little bit more to that which is that it's all on a gamma curve right so the gamma curve is not an absolute value curve mm -hmm. it is not this signal level means exactly this many nits instead it is a floating curve that can be adjusted up and down uh, depending on the capabilities of the display. So if your display can't show true black, you can move the entire curve up along that gamma curve, or you can shrink the content uh, to fit within the capabilities of your display as long as it stays on that gamma curve. So that is a very distinct difference between SDR and HDR. In HDR, the values are exact. This mm -hmm. signal means exactly this many nits. In HDR, it's different in SDR, so... That's that's a little preamble. All right. The question continues. Mm -hmm. Then with HDR, to his understanding, the first 50% of the signal is for 0 to 100 nits, and that should pretty much look the same as SDR, right? It's only the spectacular highlights and small, very bright images. <laughs> spectacular. Spectacular? Spectacular. <laughs> oh, whatever. Spectacular. Yeah, they could be spectacular. Uh, specular. Who uses the word specular? HDR people. You and small, very bright images on the screen that use the extra data above 100 nits in, in HDR. Is this correct? Yes. Yeah, that, okay. that is all exactly spot on. So you have now a 10-bit signal, which means you have 1,024 possible values. Some of the bottom of that is taken off and thrown away for video black, and some of the very top is taken off and thrown away for above white. Um, but generally, you have somewhere just shy of 1,000 values. Um, for a 10-bit signal, and the first 50% of that are exact values that correspond to NIT output levels between 0 and 100. Then from 50 to 75% of the signal is for 100 to 1,000 NITs, and then from 75 to 100% of the signal is for 1,000 to 10,000 NITs. That is the HDR signal that we're using right now. I made a mistake. Hold on. Okay. I'm almost back. Okay. <laughs> So why then, when using OPPO's HDR to SDR conversion, would we suggest setting the target luminance below 100 nits? HDR content already calls for 100 nits sometimes, and this projector renders them just fine at 50 nits. When it's sending out 100 nit HDR peaks result in the same thing, HDR peaks are tone mapped down to 100 nits by the OPPO, then this projector renders that, that at 50 nits while fitting the rest of the signal below that, or is he misunderstanding somehow? I don't understand any of that, so yeah. <laughs> so he's saying, okay, if we tell the OPPO that the brightest you should get is 100 nits max, right, 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 isn't that the same as the original SDR signal, which could potentially be 100 nits max? Yeah, so he's that like, makes Should, sense. Shouldn't that, that be sense. the target? Ah, but remember, the SDR is on a floating curve. The HDR right. is not. So uh, if you tell the OPPO that my target luminance for maximum light output is 100 nits, it's going to send out a signal that expects 100 nits, not 50, 100. Right. It is a this signal means exactly this many nits. So you have to tell the OPPO, your target luminance, the actual nits that your projector can show peak. And if oh, what right. it can show peak is 50, you need to set the target luminance to 50 because the signal needs to say, give me 50 nits. Right. If not, you're going to blow out all your whites then, right? Yeah, you, it would clip off. It would clip yeah. off the white detail above. So really what it comes down to is SDR is this gamma curve that can float. It's not exact values. HDR are exact values. So the number is the number. So if you can figure out the peak light output of your projector and screen combination within your room, uh, and many times there actually is a little bit more light available above what comes out for peak SDR. 
that even with the same lamp settings and everything, you can actually eke out a little bit more. So that's why I suggest if you've calibrated your projector for SDR and you're getting a nice SDR image that you really like, uh, you know, try 50, 75, and 100 on the target luminance slider because there might be some extra light available when you go right. into HDR mode, even without changing the lamp mode. Uh, very often on projectors that have been properly calibrated for SDR, the 75 nit setting on the OPPO ends up looking the best because there's a little bit more light above uh, 15 foot Lamberts, above 50 nits, uh, but not all the way up to 30 foot Lamberts, all the way up right. to 100 nits. It's, it's not quite there. So 75 is often what looks best. So he's read that HDR can have greater detail in the shadows. How? Again, isn't the first 100 nits in the signal pretty much the same as SCR? And then it's just extra highlights above that? How would ha how would that have any bearing on the shadow detail? Well, it sounds to me like, you know, when we're looking at these uh, absolute values that you're getting from HDR, I mean, you have more, you have more steps than you would have with an S SDR signal, which gives you the ability to have greater, great, you know, variation and uh, gradations between the, the, the different colors so you should be able to have more color variants between all the colors not just the shadow detail but all the all the color detail yeah that that is uh definitely true because like i say you got this 10-bit signal uh you have 1024 steps to work with in sdr you have an 8-bit signal you have right. 256 steps to work with plus the now, uh the color gamut is bigger so you, yep. there's just there's just physically more colors in hdr than there are in sdr that is also true so yeah so even though uh, we're talking only half of the HDR signal is used for 0 to 100. That's still 512 values mm -hmm. instead of 256. So you have more values. You can get finer gradation, uh, which is necessary because we've increased the color gamut. But there's more to it as well because... When we're talking about this HDR stuff, uh, it's it's kind of funny. This If we get to the question later, there's, a, there's another HDR versus SDR question. And honestly, I'm like, it, it shouldn't be this complicated. Like all the stuff I just explained about, you know, nits and exact values and all, like how is a, a regular person supposed to comprehend any, any of that? They want a, a one sentence explanation. What is HDR video? And unfortunately, the thing that most people have glommed onto is it's brighter. Yeah. But that isn't really true. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that the overall image looks any brighter at all. In fact, it very often looks dimmer because it's these absolute values. And most people have set their SDR to be brighter than 100 nits and floated everything on that gamma curve upward. So when they go over to HDR mode, everything actually looks dimmer. That's very often what happens. But the reason that most of the time you're hearing this description of HDR has greater detail in the shadows, that's actually going all the way back to the camera stage of things. Mm. Because when you're recording HDR, you have many more f-stops on an HDR camera to work with. You can capture shadow detail and bright highlights at the same time. It's like having a greater range of exposure in the camera. So SDR, if you properly exposed a bright image, your shadows would just become all black, right? You'd crush everything in the near black area just down to black so that you can have proper exposure for the bright thing that you're mm -hmm. looking at but in hdr with this huge range of f-stops in the camera you can have that highlight detail at the very same time as retaining the shadow detail so that's what we're talking about where hdr can show greater detail in the shadows is you can have a bright thing on the screen at the same time as the shadow detail you don't have to sacrifice one for the other that's right uh, that's everything for him, right? It yeah. is. Infinite Gary. Gary says, there are a small number of discs, notably the Star Wars Saga on Blu-ray, in particular, that have 6.1 soundtracks rather than 5.1 or 7.1. Mm -hmm. If Gary wants to hear 6.1 exactly how it was intended, should he disconnect one of his surround back speakers and move that single speaker, uh, surround back speaker to the middle directly behind his seat? No, don't do that. Uh, the two speakers that are back there are going to both get the same thing, mm -hmm. which will create a perfect phantom center of which we have spoken with. So just sit between the two and you'll be fine, which you are already doing. So it'll be fine. He for sure is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. You can definitely still have seven speakers set up. Uh, yeah. The two at the back will be playing in mono. Um, now, I, fine. I don't entirely yeah. disagree with THX's suggestion of placement, which was to have the two surround back speakers closer together. 
which is exactly how mine are placed because uh-huh. of the the limitation of the door to my bathroom. Yeah, because it. I mean, it was the the Star Wars movies in particular. They were THX surround. They yeah. were that six point one Dolby EX THX right. surround. That was that the was a format. long time ago, dude. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's going yeah. back a ways. But that but is, that yeah. that was the soundtrack. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So the the THX speaker setup for seven speakers. Uh, would theoretically be the ideal. That's that's what it was engineered for. So they were using seven speakers, two surround backs, but they had them positioned closer together. And if you think about a movie theater, Gary, movie theaters have speakers all along the back walls, and they're yeah. all playing mono anyways. Yeah. In in this in this exact same situation, so you're just being more like an actual movie theater. So yeah. hopefully that that assuages your 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 mind for a second there. <laughs> Secondly and lastly, he asked tweeter breakup mode. What is it? How important is it? Revel mentions that their Brillium tweeter in their new Performa BE series has a breakup mode above 40 kilohertz. Mm-hmm. What are the t- tweeter breakup modes of some of the speakers we recommend all the time? Appearing uh, RBH, Ascend, all those. Is it just higher is better? The idea with tweeter ba- breakup or is talking about it. First of all, if you talk about it being at 40 kilohertz, no one, I mean, only people who find that important important or people who have no idea what tweeter breakouts are or why it's important the idea here it just has to be above 20 kilohertz yeah above 20 kilohertz means you can't hear it it's not in fact not only that there shouldn't be any content on the disc really but the, with, other with the high res audio can contain it because it's sampling it well above 48 kilohertz so you still can't hear it. So let it break up all at, all at once up there, as long as it's not creating any noise or harmonics back down into the hearing range. In the audible range, yeah, right? Yeah, in audible range. You don't have to worry about it. 20 kilohertz, above 20 kilohertz is all that matters. They could say 100 kilohertz. I'd be like, yeah, it still doesn't matter. You know, the, where's its low breakup point then? <laughs> I mean, <is> it break <laughs> up, if, if it's breaking up at 40 kilohertz up high, where's the low break? Where you have to cross this thing over? For at, a speaker designer, knowing the low breakup point for the tweeter is actually much more important much than more the high important. breakup. That's right. Well, uh, for a tweeter, yeah, for a tweeter. For a mid-range, oh, yeah. you, want to, you have to know both. That's right. Because you're trying to cross them over into both, both the tweeter and to the woofer or you know, whatever's below there. That so. is true. Yeah. But what is it, Tom? What is a breakup mode? Oh, it's when the the material that's creating the sound, whatever that might be, this time it's beryllium, mm-hmm. might be, you know, uh, woven, what do they call it? Woven fiber. Instead of Aramid Kevlar. fiber? Yeah, yeah they the, call the it. The generic name for Kevlar, could, sure. Could be uh, aluminum, could oh, be yeah. paper. Could be titanium. T- titanium. Could be also. silk. Silk domes, yeah. 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 Could Lots be of things. A, could be a very thin membrane. Mylar? That's, that's held into an electric, electromagnetic field that vibrates back and forth it's yes. whatever whenever that material starts to deform as it's going in and out yeah we, so we as it pushes the... as it pushes out it should be pushing out the air evenly as it comes back in it should be pushing back evenly if it deforms if it warps if it starts to vibrate as it comes in and out that's breakup yeah yeah we want whatever is coupling to the air to create the sound to move back and forth like a perfect piston that's what we want the movement to be once that thing starts to deform within itself, that is the breakup. That's bad. That's right. Yeah. And that's like, to get to get into the kind of behind baseball of speaker design. That's the whole idea of crossovers. Why do we cross over a tweeter into a mid range instead of having a single full range driver? Because mm. a full single full range driver will break up at some point. Mm-hmm. Or, or and if you're trying to do all the ra- all the frequency, it'll break up at many points <laughs> throughout the yeah. four frequency range. It might be okay from <laughs> one point to one point, then it starts to break up, and then it's okay again for a bit, and then it breaks up again you know, as, it's trying, as, as it hits some resonances and other things. So that's exactly why we have multiple drivers within the, within the box. It's because we are trying to avoid these breakup modes, mm-hmm. these areas where the, 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 the driver breaks up. We should say, to be fair, it can be related to how much you're asking the thing to That's move. True. That's because true. a great example of a single full range driver that works really well is a headphone. Sure. Headphone. And it doesn't have most, to move very much because yeah. it's awfully close to your ear. It well, most headphones loud. are single full range drivers and they mm-hmm. work all right without breaking up, but that's because they're moving very, very little. So yeah. if you're trying to fill an entire room with sound, this is going to be a challenge. It's the same thing as subwoofer too. We've talked about that many times where a subwoofer is not big enough for your room. Why do we care about that? Well, other than physically breaking the subwoofer, it's going to start distorting. 
Yep. And that distortion comes from breakup. It's going to wobble somewhere. So yeah, the other speakers that we tend to talk about, um, so you can't exactly just go by their rated frequency response yeah. because that tends to be frequency response, which means it, it could potentially play much higher. It's just that it's getting quieter and quieter as it does, and they're listing the negative three decibel point or something right. like that. But in general, it's not going to be like a full octave above that rated frequency. Usually right. the reason it's starting to get quieter is because it's it's getting towards its stress point where it's going to start to wobble within itself. So we can't say just look at the frequency response at the high figure on there and that is the breakup point. It's it's going to be somewhere above that, but it's you're you're within the ballpark uh, a little bit more. It's a clue that whatever the rate of frequency response. So most of the ones that we're looking at, they're rated at what, like 22 kilohertz minus yeah. 3 dB, something around there, which means they're probably starting to break up in the 25, 27 kilohertz range is what I would suspect. Um, so yeah, so being rated up to 40 kilohertz, I mean, I don't doubt it. You know, Revel knows how to measure speakers really, really well. And beryllium is a fantastically stiff and lightweight material that could be vibrated really, really quickly without deforming. So yeah. I don't doubt that figure. It's just, it's not really important. <laughs> the only people who care are the ones who have bought into the high res audio. I want 96 kilohertz or 192 kilohertz or 384 kilohertz sampling, uh, because I, I think that I can hear what dolphins hear but but you can't you're a human and you can't maybe they really are dolphins have you ever thought of that they could actually be dolphins i'm trying to talk to bats <laughs> you're like i don't understand every time i listen to my music at home during this one section where it's nice and quiet like animals in my neighborhood go absolutely right. ballistic <laughs> <laughs> the dogs start howling. The bats are screeching and coming out of the trees. <laughs> the manatees are beaching themselves. I don't think manatees can hear. I don't anything. know if manatees. I think manatees can hear subsonic. <laughs> I have no idea what manatees can hear. Whales can hear subsonic. They are a weird looking animal, dude. I've seen them. They are just bizarre. Sea cow. Sea cows. Don't touch them. They, mm. you get in big trouble in Florida. There's some lady. <laughs> They do not play around with manatees. You touch a manatee and like everybody's on their cell phone. You could see what this person from New York's doing. Come down here. Alvin. Alvin wants to do the opposite of our usual goals with dual subwoofer placement. He wants to create an intentional, uneven base from seat to seat so that his seat gets good base, but his wife's seat gets less base. Mm. Mm. I can I can see how this could be the case. I can see how it could be too, to be honest with you. His room is 12 by 15 by 8, but there's an opening to the right that leads to his kitchen. Pretty much all of his back wall is taken up with bookcases. There's a sliding glass door at the front left wall, and his sofa is about 5 feet from the back wall and is pushed over against the left wall. Let me see this again. 12 by 15 by 8, mm -hmm. opening on the right that leads to the kitchen. Yep. Back wall is bookcases, sliding door in the front left wall, and his couch is on the left wall, but five feet into the room from the back. Yep. So given the restrictions of his setup, uh, he put one of his subs in the front. He's got two subs. One of his subs in the front right corner. His other sub is close to the rear left corner as he could, uh, given the bookcase behind it. His rear left sub is directly behind his his leftmost seat, and that is where his wife likes to sit. Yep. There is, therein lies your problem. <laughs> Alvin says that even though he has that opening to his kitchen, he's pretty much he's getting pretty close to uniform base across the sofa with his position, but it's too tactile and loud for his wife. So what's the solution? Is there an alternative placement or something that he could do uh, with the settings on the subwoofers? One being a Paradigm, PS1000, the other being a Polk PSW1000. Okay, the tactile thing behind it, that seat is just the subwoofer physically being there. That's just all That's, that is. That is uh, certainly playing a role in that without uh, question. Yep. Now, making uneven bass. Now, when we talk about uneven bass, it's not like you sit in one seat and it's like... This is the most amazing thing I've ever heard. I really feel the bass everywhere, and it's amazing, and it's totally clear and totally even. And then you scoot over a seat, you're like, there is no bass in this movie whatsoever. Nothing. What we're talking <laughs> about uneven is that second seat might be have big nulls in it where they're not hearing nearly as much at certain frequencies, but they might also have huge peaks at different frequencies. Yep. So, so by making uneven bass, you may actually make it 
10 times worse mm-hmm. during certain parts of certain movies. Yeah, when we're talking non-uniform, we're saying that there are ups and downs in every seat. Normally, what we're trying to do is get the same ups and downs across different frequencies in all three seats, then we can equalize it and all three seats will experience the same equalization. Right. It's not that across all frequencies, one seat is loud and one seat is quiet. It's just gonna be, what what would end up happening is you would have different ups and downs from seat right. to seat, which right. means when you go to equalize the money seat, you could make the other seat way worse. Right. So yeah, that's not the, solution or the goal <laughs> so what can you do this is a challenge this is a challenge the, e- the the solution well first a test number one mm. is to move your wife to the other end of the couch you yeah. say honey try to sit over here and see if it, you like it better yeah you don't have to stay there my love and here's some popcorn and also a, some licorice for you to enjoy at this other seats that you can enjoy and if she sits over there goes as as way better over here then you know it's just the physical proximity to the subwoofer yeah yeah but i have a feeling that's not gonna be it (laughs) (laughs) because the the issue is he's like i got pretty good uniform base and normally that's like yay you got uniform base and and uh, i i mean i you can turn all of it down, but then you don't get the experience that you want, but you get a happier wife. So that that is something. Um, yeah, I mean, mm. you might just be in a in a LFC situation here, you know, turning on the low the the low frequency the Odyssey, containment the, the low frequency containment where it chops off the bottom end of the base. <laughs> the fa- the fancy name for we turn down the base. <laughs> yeah, I think that I think that might be where you live right now, and you uh, just when your wife's not around or. Yeah, goes to bed or something. You can turn this on, full full blast. Yeah, because I mean, um, he's he's not even saying that. Because actually, this will be another question coming up later. He's not even saying that. Like, we really notice the sub that's behind us and not the one that's in front of us. Because right. if that were the case, it could be just a matter of level matching, which is you just you you turn down the subwoofer that's behind you. But he's not describing that. Nope. He's just like I've got I've got bass that I really like. It's just that the same bass in the seat next to me. The person next to me doesn't like that. Yeah. So one of you, it's time to change the heart, to... <laughs> the hearts and minds, son. It's a, it's He's it's out. a it's a it's a media blitz. It's a it, it, it's a it, it, it's a it's a com- campaign of base. You have to campaign for the base. You have to sell it. Uh, you have to go to the movie theater and say, "You feel this? This is what we got at home." A, a, a good is deal it. is when both parties come away not entirely happy. So uh, maybe That's you turn true. it down a little bit. I would turn like, it down a little bit. It's still it's still a bit louder than I would like, and you're like it's still quieter than I would like. But neither of you is happy, but neither of you is mad. Maybe that I, we don't have a better solution, Alvin. I'm sorry, dude. I it, can't fix this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there is no cone of fix. silence we I, can put over I your like wife. I like the bass, and my wife doesn't like the bass, <laughs> and we're both hearing the same thing. That's right, because it Ooh. sounds like you you've got good bass, and yeah. your wife. Wife's just like, ooh, bass. I don't but like bass. I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. It's like my wife and bacon. Yeah. My wife loves bacon. She flat out refuses to eat bacon in any form other than just as bacon. Like okay. she does not want to take bacon and put it on a hamburger. She just wants a piece of bacon. You give her the bacon, she eats the bacon. But she don't want to put the bacon on stuff. I find that extremely bizarre. But that's her. That's mm-hmm. the way she is. And there's no amount of me saying this tastes really good with bacon <laughs> that will convince her to put the bacon onto the thing. Mm. I mean, how do you not think a cheeseburger tastes better with a little bit of bacon on it? I mean, I, I, bacon's good. But, so, you may have to do some negotiation here, sir. Uh, yeah. Uh, you may have to, to, to go to the, to the negotiation table and say, listen, here's our options. First of all, Let's go to. I would start off by going to the movie theater and saying, sure. "Let's go to the movie theater. Let's go to watch a movie at the movie theater." And then afterwards, go, "Okay, how did that sound in comparison to our to our house?" Mm. And if she says it was way too loud, and our house is much right. better than this, you're like, "All right, we're already on on bo- <laughs> we're, we've already made some progress here." But if she says it sounds exactly the same at your house, you're like, "All right, good." We have succeeded in making a movie theater experience at home. I uh-huh. know. I understand that you don't want it to be a movie theater experience like that all the time. Maybe sometimes 
we can do some things uh, in a way that makes it not quite a movie theater experience and other times we can turn them the we can turn it up you know and have the movie theater experience and then you know you can negotiate that way i know it in my house i don't really turn the volume up in here very loud unless we're watching a movie and then i insist it has to be loud when we're right. watching a movie it has to be uh, we like when we watched Maleficent, it was, it was shaking everything, it was amazing. So it was just, it was real good in here during Maleficent. And I kind of noticed the Atmos up mixing too, it was kind of yeah. nice, a little bit, a little bit of there, kind of flying around the fairies, all flying around doing their thing. So, well, you if know, you're that's up sort mixing of, and you want to notice it more, you should use the, the DTS up mixer. I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna give that a go. You know, yeah. I need to recalibrate in here, anyways. It's yeah. been a while. I, I don't. I know we don't talk. I, God, we're gonna. I'm gonna say it, and then we're gonna get a bunch of questions about it. But I just like to recalibrate every once in a while because I, I know it doesn't go out of calibration. But my kids dump crap everywhere, right? right? And I, I feel like that changes the acoustics of the room. <laughs> like when I last time I mentioned this room, there were no blankets in here, and there is a job of the hut size pile of blankets on my couch right now because everyone in my family, other than me, apparently does not experience AC in the same way. Like I'm sitting here going. This is the temperature this house should be. It feels very good in here. Everybody else has got a blanket on. Do they wear blankets all the time? No. Just when sitting in here. I don't understand it. It gets hot. Okay, I don't want to get into this. This is going all over the place. Anyways, so I'm going to recalibrate. David. David applied all of our previous advice about panel placement, subwoofer placement, and which of his speakers to use as surrounds in his new small enclosed theater room. The small EMP tech surrounds definitely made more sense mounted on his side walls versus his much larger RBH dipoles. Oh, I remember this guy because mm -hmm. I felt bad about saying that. And he might ha add one or two more panels, but overall, he's quite pleased with the results. So we're, we've got some pictures here. I guess if you're watching this on YouTube, you will see pictures. When he ran Odyssey twice... For the first time ever, it actually identified his front speakers as small all on their own. It gave them a 40 hertz crossover, but it always identified them as large in his previous room. He finds that curious. So we're looking at some pictures here. We see his front speakers up front, which are, are those on stands? Those are, those are they are on, on stands. stands. Yep, those are on Man, stands. I cannot see anything on my computer. What is the deal with my brightness on my computer? I it don't like know, but those, those, are, those are the RBH uh, uh, woofer, tweeter woofer designs, yeah. left, center, right. MTM designs, yeah. Nice speakers. Yes, very nice speakers. And then he's got the little ones around in the, the surrounds. Uh, yep, duty, some and EMP he's got techs some working as his uh, surround speakers mounted on the wall. It's looks good looks very stuff. good. Yeah. He also experienced fully pressurized bass for the first time. It was a literal take your breath away sort of feeling, and he loved how much each gunshot in John Wick 2 sounded and felt distinctively different. Yeah. But that brings us to his bass problem. One of his dual SBS PB1000 subs in the, in the rear left corner, he can definitely localize it and tell that the bass is coming from his left and behind him. He tried folding up a comforter and putting it under that sub to decouple it from the, store, from the floor, but that didn't help at all. And lowering the crossover on his front speakers from 80 hertz down to 40 hertz helped a bit with some sounds, but not with others. If he's listening to music with a kick drum, he can really tell that one sub, that one sub is uh, there in the left rear. So what are his options to fix this? In his previous theater, he had enough room to put the two subs at the midpoints of the two walls, and he never had this localization issue. But his side wall placement would block his door in his small room, and there aren't really any other placement options. Okay, so he's got front, right, and rear left. I That's can't correct. Really see, can't really see the rear left. Can't really see the rear left because it's hidden by the sofa. But uh, it is like there. I'll tell you what. You have to probably step to give you guys an idea of what kind of walkway we're looking at back there. I'm guessing you have to step over the sub to get behind the couch. Oh yeah, it would look like it. Yeah, it, it really looks. There's not like not it's, a ton of space back there. There's, there's some space, which is good. He's not right up against his rear wall, but uh, yeah, not a lot I'm, of space back there wondering why this is because uh, you shouldn't be having this localization issue now part of this and this has happened to me as well too uh part of this could be psychosomatic or uh expectancy bias or whatever you want to call it where you're 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 thinking that you're hearing it from there but maybe you really aren't but it doesn't sound that way to me because it sounds like he did enough of experiments for me to believe that that's what's going on um i mean he he ran odyssey twice so yeah. I gotta believe he's got the calibration that the the do we know what receiver he has? I I'm pretty sure he told us last time, but I can't remember offhand. I I really think this is a level matching problem. Because that's because that's the only, the only problem I can possibly imagine is that the 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 
the left sub is just literally too loud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, because uh, so in, in my tiny little theater, which is about the same size as his from the looks of it. Uh, no, I have my two subs at the midpoints of my two side walls. Yeah, but you can pretty much go like this. And I can out. I can reach out. Well, not right now with my stupid messed up shoulder, but I can reach out and touch a sub basically by leaning just a little bit. Um, if I make one of them not very much louder than the other, yeah, I can shift the sound stage over to that side of the room. It, mm. it, it, yeah, it it doesn't take much. So I'm not saying he didn't level match them. I'm saying that this could be a, a surprisingly small adjustment that needs yeah. to be made. Um, I mean, you know, he, he just got this room set up. Right. So right. the notion that there could be a little bit of optimization to be done and the level matching is entirely reasonable. Um, yeah. So I, I really would give that a try first because that doesn't cost anything. You don't have to move anything. This is just readjusting the, vol the relative volume levels between the one that's in the rear left and I'll the be one that's in the front right. Honest with you, the the the, the options here are pretty limited the, mm. of, for why you would be experiencing this this localization. The first one is the one I already said, which is it could be mental, which I don't think it is. Second one could be that that sub is literally too loud. Yeah, which is or more or it. actually uh, reciprocal that the front right sub is too it's quiet. Too, too quiet, right? Yeah. Either way, uh, it, it, that there you don't have a. It, the, the subs perfectly level batch, which yeah. could be it. So run on see again and just make absolutely well, sure. Well, I mean, I would try to manually level match them and then run on see with the subs in mono. Yeah, you could do that too. Yeah, maybe he's got them in mono. Maybe he didn't level match them, and maybe it's an older receiver. We just yeah. don't know. Uh, maybe he just put the dials at the same spot and That's said, right. "I'm good to go." Which probably worked when they were on the mid side walls. Yes, absolutely. But now it now it's different. Now it doesn't. Uh, the other thing could be is. It, the sub could be distorting or broken or creating some sort of noise. And that Possibly. noise could would clue you into a, the location where it is. doesn't sound like that's it either. So if it's not the level matching, you need to come back to us and then we'll try to figure out something else out. But honestly, I have no idea what that will be other than to move both subs to the front just, of the road. Yeah, and, I mean, just you know. given my own experience of intentionally making one of my two subs louder than the other and, and hearing it localize over to that side... I, I think it's as simple as that. And it, it can be a surprisingly small amount of volume adjustment. Mm -hmm. So give it a try. Stefan, this is a guy from Belgium. Mm -hmm. So that's exciting. Uh, Stefan's colleague asked him to recommend some new sound equipment for the subwoofer. Uh, Stefan immediately suggested SVS since we've talked about them so much. Finding a dealer in Belgium wasn't easy, but they found an online retailer. And due to science constraint, his co colleague ended up with the SB1000. They set the crossover knob on the SB1000 as high as it would go, and he set the volume knob at halfway. The AVS receiver auto setup was run, and playing a Blu-ray movie res resulted in satis a satisfying amount of bass. Mm -hmm. But his colleague told him that when he powered down the su system, he noticed a very faint rumbling sound, and if he lightly touched his hand to the driver, he could feel it moving a little bit. Even when the receiver was powered off, and even when the sub was disconnected, and on, and on, the only plug going into it was the power cord. He tried connecting a CD player directly to the sub with the receiver in between, and the without rumble the was, receiver. In I'm sorry, without the receiver in between, and the rumble was still there. Turning down the volume dial on the sub seemed to reduce the volume of the rumble a little bit, but was still audible, albeit very faint. Naturally, he wrote to SVS, but Ed Egg, Egg Mullen replied that. This seemed to be just the idle noise floor of the subwoofer's amp, and they considered it to be within normal parameters. Ed said that once the content was playing, the noise floor would be inaudible. And, uh, I'm sorry, an email just came in, and I have to read it. <laughs> and to turn off the subwoofer, either via a trigger control or just waiting for the auto sensor to drop the sub into standby. Stefan doesn't think this is normal. His subs don't rumble like this at all times. What is our take, and can it be resolved? Well, because it, you plugged it directly into the wall and nothing else was plugged into it and you were still getting the rumble, mm -hmm. either Ed Mullen is right and it's just the noise floor of the sub that is doing this, or more likely, I think, is that there is something with the electrical current in this house which is causing some noise. It doesn't that the sound like a ground loop, though. No, it's not loud enough to be a ground loop. No, uh, I mean, ground a ground loop, loop is, is a distinctive loud. 60 yeah. hertz hum. Well, 50 hertz over there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But it's that, I mean, that would be a, a real tone hum. So I don't think it's a ground loop. Well, I mean, the, the other options are what? I can't think of anything that would make this other than just the, the amp being defective. Yeah. Well, that's just it. I, 
I don't agree with Ed on this. It, this sounds like the exact same sound I heard from my first Axiom EP500. Hmm. Uh, it was the it was the very same thing. Plug it in, nothing else plugged into it, and there's like a <laughs> quiet, but <laughs> going on. And you could even see the driver, you know, faintly moving a little bit and doesn't matter what you plug into it. And yes, once something is playing that completely masked it because it wasn't super loud, but it was there. There was a noise floor for sure. Now in Axiom's case, who had really good customer service, just like SVS does, they sent me a replacement amp. Like they just straight up sent me a replacement amp. I swapped them out and the new amp was dead quiet. Hmm. So, um, you know, like my SVS subs, they are dead quiet. They're like, I can practically push my ear against the back of the amp when it's on and not hear any kind of electrical hum which even my hsu sub which is really good and has a bash amplifier if i like physically press my ear against it then i can hear like the transformer inside giving off a faint hum but yeah you know, from like anything from an inch away it's dead side but like yeah my svs subs are dead quiet i i think i would try hard to get an amplifier replacement i i don't think this is normal hmm. yeah i mean that, that that's really the only thing that i can think of that that would be doing this yeah I mean, the 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 power i mean at first i thought until i heard, until i read the part with the receiver being disconnected completely yeah i thought maybe like the the trim level on the receiver was maxed out or something, something like yeah that. yeah or even like a, a, a cable lying across another cable and yeah. picking up interference or something right i guess that's i mean i really the only thing the only other thing it could be in my mind is some sort of interference that's coming in through mm -hmm. the power cable or through something else you know uh, either way I, I don't think it's normal i don't agree no nah, i mean it, all the svs subs i've heard the modern ones anyway yeah they they are dead quiet they are stone quiet when they're not playing so i i disagree with that on this one uh and look it's svs so at the end of it if they're unwilling to swap out the amp which i would find a bit surprising from them if you press well, them on it I mean, a bit then shipping it all the way to belgium i guess it's what's but, well, they, they have european dealers though so they should, I, yeah so I, mean, I would i would return it i would just return it because yeah, i, I don't right. think it should be like this that's not yeah. right i agree aiden Aiden got a second subwoofer for his theater, and he's keen on positioning them at the midpoints of opposing walls, but that would result in one of the subs being right in front of his closet door, and he keeps all of his gear inside that closet. Okay, this sounds like a, a, a long question for a very short answer. <laughs> he had an AC vent installed within his closet, but there's a f and, and there's a fan to make sure all of his gear gets hit with cool air, but it's not a closed loop si system inside the closet. The air coming in via the AC vent just escapes into the room. Mm -hmm. So would it be wise to close the closet door when he's using his system so that he can have his subwoofer, his ideal subwoofer placement? Would opening the closet door once he's done uh, watching something be good enough? enough um okay don't have them have them right in the smack dab midpoint of the wall offset them a little bit offset one <laughs> yeah. a little bit towards the front of the room and offset the other one exactly the same amount towards the back of the room yep. whichever way works to make this door situation work out is what you need to do well and then I'm you can trying have to your figure door. out like if he did like so is he gonna close the door move the sub into position yeah that's what he's going to do. That's what it says. That's what he's going to do. Move the sub out of position to open up yeah. the closet door. Man. Yeah. yeah. So whatever direction you would move it to get it out of the way for where you were going to open the door anyway, leave it there. Put it there. Leave yes. it there. And then on the other side of the room, move the sub. So if you moved it forward to get it out of the way of the closet door, move the sub on the other side of the room back. Yeah. The same amount. Yeah. That, that's when it. we say the sub should be on opposing walls or in diagonally opposite corners, do the subs need to be right up against the walls or is it okay for them to be several inches away from the wall? They should be mirrored. So if your front sub is, let's just say, just say you have a sub in your front right corner, your back left corner. Sure. Okay, your right left corner. If your front sub is a foot in, you know, off the wall, uh, off the front of the room and six inches off the side wall, uh -huh. then make your back sub a foot off the back wall and six inches into the room from the side wall. Yeah. Mirrored. They, they definitely don't have to be like pressed right up against the wall. Yeah. No, 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 no. Just have them be about the same. And you know what? If it's four inches instead of six inches, that's okay too. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be fine. Very much. 
Uh, he has a different room, uh, a living room that's about 6,400 cubic feet. And he'd like to get a pair of subwoofers for that room too. What would be up to the task? This will mostly be for music and TV shows, and he's partial to cylinder subs, although he'd appreciate alternatives to HSU, rhythmic power, sound, uh, audio, et cetera, recommendations as well. Okay, uh, 64. Do you really want to pressurize this I room? I know, right? <laughs> because... Actually pressurizing, which you, you can do, but yeah. wow, is that loud? That's going to be real super duper loud, dude. And um, <laughs> unless unless it's a rectangular living room that's not open to anything else, right. placement again is going to be an issue. So if I were you, I'd buy a, 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 a you know whatever sub you wanted. <laughs> you know, basically, you want cylinders? Buy a cylinder. Buy two. Have them flank your couch, and then you're good, you're kind of done at that point. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, because I don't really think you want to fresh rise this room. This would be you. The amount of time you would spend securing all your dishes right. to every available surf. Oh my god! I just remember in my house in Jacksonville, and I've, I've told the story before, where the kids had gone behind the couch, the, the, the subwoofer, and turned the subwoofer off. Now, I've yeah. been bl I've been told that this story sounds fake. That I turned it off and I blame my kids for it. <laughs> Believe me, I did not do this. I was so happy though when it happened because I was watching the first Transformers movie and it was rattling like my entire house. Yeah. Like every wine glass. I mean, and I just thought to myself, I would love to keep it this loud. I mean, first of all, I would never, I will never be able to watch it when my wife's sleeping, but I would love to keep it this loud. But the reality is, is that I would spend every, every time I turned on the movie, <laughs> I had to go in there and rearrange all the dishes. Right. Because everything rattled. They Anything that was within, you know, you know, three millimeters of something else was was smacking against it easily. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, I, also he's he's not going for movies in this room so much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, look. I mean, hey, if you're listening to some pounding music, you you might want that pressurization to really feel that kick drum and the synth, bass synth and stuff like that. That could be the case. Right. Um, little... But so, I mean, if you were going for a cylinder and you really wanted to handle this room size, I would point you to the plus. The PC twelve plus, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, for most people, the two thousand is probably going to be okay, but it will it will max out in this room size before you fully pressurize it. That's true. So yeah. I could point you to the plus. That would be up to the task of this room size if you want the HSU alternatives. Um, would you go for the full V um, VTF fifteen H? You could probably probably go down to the VTF three in the HSU lineup. <sighs> Because, I mean, the, the VTF3 <laughs> so is the same stuff. driver and amp, just in a slightly smaller cabinet. Yeah. So, yeah, the VTF3, I think, from HSU in Rhythmic, I wouldn't go for the full FV15 HP. I'd go for, like, the FVX15 in their lineup. Uh, power Sound, well, they only start with a 15-inch, so <laughs> go go for the 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 entry-level <laughs> entry 15-inch from Power Sound, which is, you know, still a $1,000 sub. Um, right. Yeah, so those would be the alternatives. Those are all... 100, 120 pounds or something. Big <laughs> boxes. Drag those are big yeah. boxes. So I'd like a cylinder, too. I missed the... I mean, for a while there, we had a couple of, you know, fly-by-night. They were We didn't know they were fly-by-night at the time, subwoofer manufacturers that were making, like, subwoofer cabinets. And I was really liking that design. It's, it's like a cylinder, but... Oh, know, like Elemental Design. Elementals was, sure. was doing it for a long time. Of course, you know, we all know what happened with them. But uh, I, I did like that. And I always... I still feel like that should be a viable design. Well, Rhythmic that, has, has that one that is, like, genuinely refrigerator size. One. It's one, and it's a refrigerator. Yeah. The whole point of this is that you don't have to make this big. Pa Power Sound has that quadruple, is it quadruple 18s, or it's at least quadruple 15s drivers Whatever. in a gigantic cabinet. Jeff. Jeff has a projector ceiling mount, and he ran conduit from his equipment closet to that ceiling mount location so that he could install an HDMI cable, HDMI cable after construction was complete. He also had a power outlet installed in the ceiling near the mount, but he didn't think about battery backup beforehand. Mm. Is there a very compact battery backup solution that, that he could plug into that ceiling outlet to protect uh, the projector? There is a small... Uh, APC unit, right? That's there like a itty bitty box thing. It's like not too big. Yeah, it's a it's a lithium ion battery. It's mm. their UPS Pro 500 lithium ion. Uh, now it does have four outlets, so uh, two of them are surge only, and two of them are the battery backup. Just make sure you plug it into the right one. That's all. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, it's it's I don't. It's about the size of a of a router, I'd say. 
mm. or or maybe a cable modem. Mm. It's it's about that size. So it's not exactly like it's going to just plug into the outlet and hang from the outlet just by the friction of the plug or something. You're, you you right. would have to secure it to the ceiling somewhat. Um, but it's it's certainly something that could be reasonably secured to the ceiling close to the projector uh the issue is it's uh how much is it like 300 bucks or so so it's not it's not exactly inexpensive um just just for the one device is what you're protecting there it's too bad Um, that you didn't have the wire run directly back to his equipment cabinet yeah so i mean i know you can find it for less than the full retail price but it it, it is the msrp is 300 dollars on that lithium ion one um but just just answering the question directly, that would be the solution I would point you toward. Oh, okay. Once well, so you're done. Yeah. He has an APC J25B in his equipment closet for the rest of his gear. Could he run an extension cord and his HDMI cable in the conduit? Would the power cord cause signal interference in the HDMI cable? Well, what it would cause is if your house burnt down, you're not going to get no money because you put an extension cord and conduit through your wall. Yeah, that's it's, not up to code. That's not going to be up to code. That's what's really going. That's that's really why we're going to tell you no. Yeah, don't now, do this. Don't can't, just can't, flat out don't do it. Is it physically possible for you to do it? <laughs> yes, it is absolutely not something you should do. For I don't even know if it is physically possible because it depends on the diameter of the conduit where the, the plug conduit, would even yeah. fit through the thing. Well, let's just pretend that it's he's got like a big old four inch. But d- d- no, don't do this. No, don't against this. code, bad. Bad, yeah. bad, bad. Would it cause uh, signal interference for the HDMI cable uh, to run the HDMI and the, the power cable right next to each other? Uh, I mean, theoretically, yes. Uh-huh. But depends on which HDMI cable you buy. If you and... went fiber optic, it wouldn't. Because fiber, well, optic fiber optic has no sure electrical would. signal going through. That's it's right. just a light pulse. So. But if it's got good enough shielding, it shouldn't either. So what HDMI cable specs should be looking for? There are an overwhelming amount of numbers, labels, and alphabet soup. Uh, 18.2 gigabits per yeah, second, Yeah, just 18, 18.0. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, you should look for. yeah so I mean, if, if you're going for a standard copper, so meaning this run is 25 feet or shorter, which it might be, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, if it's 25 feet or shorter, you would look for an HDMI high-speed premium that would be the official label, and that will say that it passes 18 gigabits per second. If it's between 25 and 50 feet, you're probably going to want to go for an active HDMI cable. Those don't get to put the HDMI high-speed premium logo on there because it's not like an official thing that HDMI LLC does. So you're looking for 18 gigabits per second bandwidth. That's what you're looking for. And if it's longer than 50 feet, you want to go to fiber optic HDMI. And again, you're looking for 18 gigabits bandwidth that's 18 gigabits per second bandwidth yeah lastly he says is this a lesson that you should always run two conduits perhaps and the answer to that is no that this is a lesson that when we pay a professional to come install our home theaters this is the stuff they know that we don't is is about these sorts of things you know and 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 $300, $300 or let's say you can get it for 250 $250 for this this thing, uh, this 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 power condi- uh, the, the battery, battery backup, backup yeah. is probably more expensive than it will cost to have somebody come in, depending on the room that you're in. Right. If you have if you have attic access above this room, mm. it is not a big deal to run a Romex to right. You know, for, you could actually run it to the exact same box that the other one yeah. that's in, uh, that, that the power is in, uh, or yeah, actually, that's what you should do is run it to the exact same box that the power is in and then run it on that cable back down to where your other equipment uh, is near equipment near is. your existing J25 then, and just have a male inlet instead of a female outlet attached right. to that. So you will need a, up front instead of, you know, you'll be plugged into, you, you'll, you'll plug into that uh, just like you normally would, except you'll unplug the cable that's going to, that, that was there already. They'll have to secure that as, as electricians mm-hmm. do into a standalone box, you know, and tie everything off in the way they're supposed to so that it's not, that's not a problem. You will then take this new Romex, run it back to where your power conditioner is, and then you'll put, as, as he said, uh, a male inlet, which you'll just plug in like an, another power cord that goes from your wall. What that, you've done there is created a legal extension cord. <laughs> which is within your wall. And that shouldn't, if you have attic access or basement or something, some access mm-hmm. underneath or above this thing, 
it should be doable. And it should be less than two hundred fifty dollars, I think. Yeah, it's literally pulling one cord. That's yeah. all it's doing. And installing a, a male inlet instead of a female outlet. Yeah. And and you'll have to they'll have to put an aftermarket box on there, and that's it. I mean, yep. you could probably do everything but the running of the cable. And if you have attic access and you're not afraid of spiders or whatever the heck else is up there, <laughs> you could probably do that too. It's not a huge deal. This is, you know, this is not just not a big deal. Shane in New Zealand. So, so far we've got Belgium and New Zealand. Mm -hmm. okay. And we've got some pictures that have multiple colors on them and some say things. Yep. Reminders things. to of, of Shane's room right. there. What Shane says he this. greatly appreciates uh, us answering all of his previous theater build questions in one go. He intends to apply a lot of our advice. Well, if you're only going to do a lot of it, I'm out. <laughs> Gotta do it all. No, I don't care. You do whatever you want. He'll make uh, sure there's six inches from the back wall to the outer frame of the door. He's making sure his equipment closet has ample room to move gear in and out. And he's going to take another look at fiber optic HDMI cables, although he's also considering Emotiva's recently released HD based T solution since it isn't too crazy expensive. The biggest change of all, he and his wife decided they both like the idea of the CAF E301 on wall in and on ceiling speakers as surround surround backs and four at most overhead speakers so rob won that one awesome i, I have no horse in this race i do not remember what i suggested you suggested <laughs> going all in ceiling and in wall okay sounds like me but as long as you guys are happy this is easier anyways so but back to his ceiling we said that if he had gone with in ceiling speakers he'd need to use soundproof backer boxes otherwise all that effort to install two layers of drywall on sound clips and hat channels to block sound from reaching the bedroom above would basically be a waste so does that apply to lights and hvac vents too if some can lights and an HVAC vent would only be a small compromise, comp compromise, he'd be okay with that. But if they would basically render all that extra ceiling construction useless, he obviously doesn't want to go down that path. It would be better to install a soffit for the lighting and HVAC. Well, I mean, if you put a hole in your drywall and you don't do anything behind it, uh -huh. yes. You, you, you've got a hole. <laughs> you've got a hole. Drywall. And all that sound is going to go right through that hole. I mean, it's yep. not... All that sound pressure is going to go out. Now, acoustically, it doesn't make that much difference for your room because it's not a huge amount of sound leakage. You know, it's not like an open doorway or, or something like that. Right. But... But upstairs, the bedroom... Upstairs, it will be a night and day difference. So, yeah. yes, you will have to do some soundproofing with your HVAC and your lights, your lights in particular. Because most yeah. of the time, oh, lights yeah. are I mean, just... Like the, uh, the, just like, they just take and they cut out a hole in your ceiling. They shove a can in there and it's completely open to the attic. Yeah, the soundproof um, uh, backer boxes that I recommended from Soundproofing Company, those are actually meant for the can lights. That's, mm. the de that's the example that they give, not even speakers. They're like, this can be adapted to work for in-ceiling speakers too, but they actually, like all the diagrams show can light installation with this. So right. you, yeah, if you can put a soffit so in other words, you have a continuous ceiling, which is your double drywall, sound right. clips and half channels. You have a continuous ceiling and then everything else is surface mounted below that or hidden within a soffit. That's what you want to do. That is soundproofing. Yeah. Yeah. Or use the backer pocket thing. Or, Either well, way. that's just, if you put a hole in that soundproof ceiling, you got to seal it up with the backer box. Yes. So could he uh, maybe leave part of the soffit without drywall and cover it with fabric instead so the soffit can sort of double as a big base strap? Yep. Yeah. Yep. I wouldn't do it for the one holding your HVAC vent, though. No, no, it's going to... Because then <laughs> that's for you inside the theater. It's not going to bother upstairs because it's, it's separated, but that's for you inside the theater. You're going to hear the HVAC going. So I would seal off whatever soffit is holding your HVAC vent. But, uh, but the other ones, if you've got them going around the sides to hold the lights, sure, you could do that. Yeah. One other thing he liked is the idea of a TV that can move so that he can always have the perfect size. But instead of a three-in-one stand, could he use a full motion wall mount instead? The type that scissor out from the wall. And if you were to use that type of wall mount, should he be concerned with sound reflections off the screen being different depending on how far the TV is from the wall? I wouldn't worry about that second thing. But the answer to your first question is yes. If you can find sure. one and you can afford it, there's no reason why you can't use this. Yeah. Uh, Sanus Chief, they make excellent ones that have like, Sanus yeah. has one now that goes like over two feet away yeah. from the wall. You need some serious lag bolts, but it can do it. 
I wouldn't worry too much about the screen, you know, the, the sound bouncing off the screen that much. I would worry about as you pull it out whether or not you still have a clean line of sight of all these speakers. Sure. That's the only thing I would worry about. If you pull it out and suddenly your left and right speaker, you can't see them anymore. Right. Well, they're yeah. they're they're, they're yeah, hitting they're like the back well of the TV. Well behind the plane of the TV now. Yeah. That's the that's the only thing I would really worry about. I mean, sure. honestly, you could. No, it's a stupid idea. Should no, I, I mean, if, if he, so he's got like, you know, full on Kef R series speakers. Right. They're about, they're, a, I think they're a little over a foot deep. So if you have them a foot off the front wall, then even if you extend the TV two feet off the wall, that you're, they're still going to be, you know, right. within the, all within one plane. So yeah, that's okay. Yeah. So he's using the Animotiva XMC1 processor and highly anticipating its long promised Atmos upgrade. <laughs> Keep on holding that breath. Yep, yep. Yeah, well, you're turning blue. Uh, with his plans now in place for eight E301 speakers, surrounds uh, backs, top fronts, top rears, and his existing CAF R series towers and center, he needs plans to power them all. He has two Emotiva UPA1 200 watt monoblock amplifiers on hand that he uses for his towers. That's a lot of power. But that leaves him needing at least nine more channels of amplification, plus he'd like to have the option to power some other zones. Options in New Zealand are a bit limited, but Emotiva ships there, so that seems like a top value option. He'd love to be able to consolidate all of his amps into a single chassis, like the XPA-11, but at two grand US. Uh, US. That's way too expensive. So he's looking at many uh, Bass Axe series amp options. So these are the options he's looking at. Uh -huh. The A5175, which is five amplifiers, uh, 175 watts. Uh, it's about 125 watts, whatever, all channels driven. Yeah, so these these all the ratings are into two channels, just like most receivers are rated. Yeah. And then they also give the all channels driven amount. Yeah. So 800 bucks for that one. He's got a 7 by 110 watts. Uh, for 600 bucks, a 5 by 110 watts for $500, an 8 by 50 watts for 500 bucks. Uh, one potential combo he has in mind would be to keep using his pair of UPA1 model blocks, add an A5175 to his power, to power center, surrounds and backs, and add an A800, which is the one that does That's 8 by 50. 50. Watt. Yeah. To power his four overheads plus four other speakers in different zones, but will the A5, uh, the A5, on the A800 be sufficient to power its overheads. Dude, I was thinking you would get the A800 and just use it for everything else. <laughs> use it for your surrounds, your backs, and your yeah. overheads. Sure. Yeah, I was going to say the, all the surrounds, the surround backs, and the overheads. That's what I was going to say. Still need something to power his center in that scenario. But <laughs> but he wanted extra amplifiers anyway. So Yeah, so then you, you maybe know. pick up like the A500 on yeah, top of that five, that powers yeah. your center and then four other speakers in other zones or some such yeah 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 i'd go for the two cheapest i'd go for the 800 and the 500 yeah. that's a thousand dollars total so definitely less than the xpa 11 at two thousand dollars all by itself right. uh that is certainly so, so 110 watts to power your center speaker when you're sitting what looks to be about seven feet away <laughs> if that because the center is probably even closer i mean and then the, I think the, the 50 watts speakers. is probably fine, to be honest with you. I think you can just get rid of those model blocks and just buy two of the A800s and have a, amplifiers uh, for everything. But I'm okay with having a little more headroom for your That I understand. I'm with you on that one. I'm with you on that one. But the model blocks are way overkill. I think that's clear, but yeah. that's fine. But he already That's has fine. Them, You've so. already got them. You've yeah. already got them. If you were going to buy them now, I'd be like, nah, dad, you got it. I mean, I see, I see the appeal of the 5175. Um, because you're thinking, oh, that's closer to 200 for my center, and then it's more than I need for my surrounds and my surround backs, which, I mean, he got 300 extra dollars burning a hole in your pocket. I'm not going to tell you you can't do it or something, but it's it's unnecessary. You, yeah, you don't need it. <laughs> I like it too. I mean, the 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 8 by 50 watts uh, is Oh, for your fine. four overheads? Totally fine. What are they, overheads. four feet above you? <laughs> no yeah, problem. So one, it says one, one, two, three, four... And he's got he's got seven right. Is he going to have seven? He's got surround backs yep. and surrounds, right? Surround backs so, and yeah. surrounds. Yeah. So all of those, yeah, that's perfectly fine, and then that's good. Yeah. So that that's if you do that though. You know what my real thing is? Sell your XMC one because keep holding your breath for that stupid Atmos update, man. And <laughs> I would buy a receiver, right? Yeah. I'd, I'd go get an X forty three hundred or an X forty four hundred, and if you so that has nine amps built in, and practically I'd be very fine with that but you've already got the two monoblocks so maybe you pick up uh 
I don't know. What should, what should he get? Because he How wants other amps for the other rooms too. Maybe maybe get the A five hundred. Yeah, get the A five. Get the A five hundred. Yeah, get the A five hundred and a receiver. And now yeah. you don't have to wait for Emotiva because you're gonna keep on waiting, <laughs> and you only have to buy one amp. And you that, that you got plenty to power all the zones and. Everything. I don't know how much that that the receiver would cost over there, but mm. oh, I mean you're going to basically get nine channels of amplification that you can use. Yeah. For about the same price as one of these. But amps. not only that, you'll actually get the seven dot two dot four that you want instead of wait forever. Oh man, I love Emotiva. Can we just say that I love we their do, amps? Buy we their, love amps. their amps. Just don't buy their process. We and love their amps. Certainly don't pre-order them. For the love of all things holy, don't pre-order them. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with that too. Dave. Dave has a refurbished SR5011 receiver and an HDMI cable from Blue Jeans Cable. Once in a while, he'll lose picture and sometimes sound. If he unplugs the HDMI cable from his France and then plugs it back in, everything seems to work fine, but a few days later, he'll lose signal again. Would it, be, it would be a pain for him to replace the cable. So what do we think? Uh, is it the cable that's the blame? Is it maybe his refurbished Marantz that has an issue? Dude, this sounds like gravity. Like 100% yep. gravity to me. <laughs> this sounds like a slightly loose HDMI yeah. plug. Yeah. So what's your solution here? Um, I mean, there's 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 ways of making these things more secure. Uh -huh. I, I, can't, I, I can't necessarily attest to any of them being a good idea i mean i would i could see my son right now I, I i've come home to have my son he's like dad something broke i fixed it i'm like oh god how much how much duct tape did you use son oh only a roll oh, uh -huh. so that's what kind of jumped into my head but i kind of feel like there are locking hdmi plugs that... well those will only work if it's the hdmi port that has the little screw above it oh, which a right. lot of them do yeah um, which I, I'm pretty sure on the back of the Marantz, they do have that, the little screw above it. So you can get, well, because they don't want to replace the cable. That's the issue. I mean, I hate that HDMI is a friction fit. Yeah. That's that was a poor choice, but, uh, but it is. So I mean, one very simple solution is usually this is just a slightly loose port plug. Right. Um, so you wedge, usually you can just do this with like, really thin needle nose pliers or if you don't have quite enough room for that but i mean literally just tighten the the marantz plug i'm talking about the, yeah that's the, what i'm thinking too you, yeah. you literally just pinch, squeeze it pinch it down just a little bit and then when you put the plug in there's more friction and it holds it in place but although that will work itself loose over time again if that's what's going i really think that's what's going on because if, if unplugging it and plugging it back in works and then a few days later it goes out again that totally just sounds like a loose plug yeah, and I mean, I, I don't. If this is an ongoing issue that you're having, I should mean, you get a pigtail? That's what I was thinking. Uh, or I mean, yeah, I mean, you could go even more extreme than that and get you know something else. But basically, uh, there's also the option of supporting the cable in some way, right? So, or like however, getting one of those like uh, right angle or swivel HDMI yeah. plugs. Yeah, that yeah. might help. That that might that might do you just you know supporting the cable by putting it you know having it come in from above or yeah. it's already coming from it's got to be coming from below coming from above a little bit just 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 kind of sneak it through something else or tie it up to the, your rack a little bit yeah just so that it's supported a bit yeah uh, would be a good solution a pigtail could be an option which yeah. is you know just a short HDMI which maybe has a right angle thingy on yeah, it yeah. to help help with the situation uh what rob just said could work as well trying a different hdmi input i mean but this sure. is the output right is this the output i'm pretty this is sure the output. yeah i think it's, yeah. it's the one going from his branch to his display i mean the 5011 does have a second hdmi output so you could just switch over to that yeah i would try that as well yeah all right tim how long how are we going here on time yeah another half hour or so <sighs> doesn't feel like it tim's theater area is it's not fair that it is only 7 30 your time it it's is. not fair it's one of these days hey when this mobile climbing wall thing takes off and i can change my schedule around a little bit we're doing this during the day uh his theater area is 16 by 25 by 9 16 feet by 25 by 9 this is tim 
but it's open at the back to the kitchen on the left to the living room so it's a bajillion square feet yeah cubic feet he has a 7.1 speaker system using all tech tech speakers and a def tech reference one sub it's a 14 inch cube with 11 inch active driver and two 10 inch passive radiators he likes the compact size but he's in getting a uniform base throughout his theater and he wants an upgrade okay first of all is his def tech sub more akin to a ported or a sealed design is more akin to a ported design than yes. a sealed design. Those, yeah. those those passive radiators are acting as ports. Like your sealed design, it is the driver going in and out, and the air inside cannot move. Yes. It has no place to go. So it acts so like as, a spring. That's right. As it pushes, as the driver pushes out, it creates a vacuum behind it. As it pushes in, it compresses the air mm-hmm. behind it. So uh, in your case, the passive radiators move in and out like the air that would be moving in and out of a port. Yep. It's the same thing. Yeah, the reason it makes sense to use passive radiators in a small cube like this is because to get the same tuning from a port, you'd need a long port, which literally might not fit within the confines of the small cube. So use passive radiators instead because you can make them the size and elasticity needed to get the tuning that you want instead of a a long port. You see this a lot in the in that's about this size drive, you know, driver complement, a twelve inch driver, a couple of twelve inch uh, you know, or 10 driver, a couple of 10 inch uh, passive radiators. I've got a, a, a Perian sub that my parents now use that's like that. Yep. So, will dual subs deliver the uniform base he's hoping for? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> more no likely way than there's... only one. <laughs> yeah, that is true. It's more likely than one, but there's no way we can be sure because of how open everything is. Yeah, this does and not it, sound like a perfect rectangle. And if it were, it'd well, be a big rectangle. And if it were a big rectangle, you'd have to put one in the kitchen and the other one in the, <laughs> you know, the, some, the living room or something like that. Like one so, in the foyer, <laughs> one in the dining room. So placement's probably going to be an issue and everything else. So will getting two subs do it? We don't know. But maybe. It could. And it's and it's a better right. chance than just one. You're gonna have to do trial and error. Uh, you're gonna have to adjust the phase knob on whichever sub is physically closer to you. And if you have many placement options, woo, that could be a lot of trial and error. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's you got a better shot at it with two than with just one. So he's heard us recommend the HSU uh, ULS 15 Mark II before, and he thinks its size, an 18-inch cube, would be acceptable. His it, budget could potentially build, be as much... Build, build, build a cardboard model. An 18-inch cube versus a 14-inch cube is significantly larger than you might imagine. It's You're like, it's only four inches bigger four in every Four inches direction. on every side. How much bigger can that possibly be? It's so much bigger. <laughs> it might be it's... so big that you can't fit it where you want to fit it. <laughs> you might not be able to get it in some doors of your house. Let's put it to you that way. <laughs> There's a chance that you have a door that this would not enter. Uh, his budget could potentially be as much as two grand for two subs. So the the dual ULS 15 price of fifteen hundred dollars plus shipping would seem to fit the bill. What's our opinion of his of this option? I agree with Rob that you need to build a box. Yeah, build, build yourself an actual physical model so you can really see what the size is. You, yes, and then once you place those two 18 inch cubes in your house. Then only, and then and only then can you say to, that the the size is applicable. That being said, I mean, I, I this I mean, this is going to be a fine sub for. This, sure, this I mean, situation. it is a sealed model. So as sealed models go, this would certainly be one of the top choices for the budget. Yeah. Um, I I would prefer since you have so much open space that you get a sub that can just play flat down to twenty hertz and you don't have to rely on any room gain. Right. So that brings us to our next one. What well, are some potential alternatives? Uh, uh, alternatives man i am fading fast oh dear um i like cylinders in I this do situation too. uh it's it's going to give you more placement options because of smaller floor space i mean this is going to be probably similar to the last guy we talked about with the pc 12 nsds or whatever they are no pc 12 they, pluses 12, 12 pluses that's what i meant which the duels of those would be a little over your two thousand dollar budget mm. i think performance wise it's worth it yeah, I think you'd have a much easier time placing them too. I think yeah. that, that's what's really. Yeah, they're easier to move to. around. I know you just roll them. You can roll them, and then <laughs> once you get close, you can heavy easily kind of walk them. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but if he wants a box, what should he get? Uh, so well, so if he wants that kind of size, I like the HSU ULS fifteen. Uh, yeah. The alternative to me would be Power Sound Audio, their S fifteen hundred, which is also 
basically an 18 inch, I think it's like 17 and a half by 18 by 18 and a half or something. So they like stole half an inch off one dimension and gave it to another. It's not quite a cube. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's very comparable. Okay. Yeah. So we've been saying uh, for a while now to wait for Cydia. Does that advice apply to subwoofers too? No, not really. Nope. <laughs> no, I don't think so. No, Cydia isn't when subwoofer companies are like, here's our stuff. They're I don't think the subwoofer companies have a time to say. I guess yeah, they're kind of like, when it's ready, here it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, if, if Emotiva makes a subwoofer, we'll know about six to ten years beforehand <laughs> before it actually starts shipping. Where, where, where's that immersal line? Where, where is that? That just completely vaporized. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. Sure. Manatees. The manatees are bringing it. Manatees. Yep. Carl. Carl enjoyed a video on YouTube, Leonard Nimoy's MagnaVision. Did either of us ever have one or have an experience with one? Carl only ever used a Pioneer laser disc player. Now, if you've watched this, you realize how very much drugs they did in the 70s. That, that is a stash. That apparently, is a stash going on on Leonard Nimoy. <laughs> apparently, they did all of the drugs because <laughs> that... that who? He was talking to a glowing crystal that beeped at him. <laughs> Who watched that and said, you know what? Nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> Ship that bad boy. I want it on every network, all three of them. Cut it, I want it on it. All that, is, that is what we had. It. That is better than what we had in mind. That was a beeping glowing crystal and a stash that we, that we only dared dream of. <laughs> I was like, my kids were watching it with me, and they're like, Daddy, what's going on? <laughs> like, just don't, don't ask. You don't understand. You know, this, I, I, this is just, it's so bad on so many levels that I can't believe that this thing didn't sell like hotcakes. I mean, who would have guessed that it would have gone flying off the shelf with Leonard Nimoy talking to a blinking lamp? It was oh, ridiculous. Uh, oh, it's a great learning tool too, because it's got it's got a movie in one language, and you can switch it to a different language and learn that language by watching Good. the movie. Two, I'm like two two audio tracks that you can switch between <laughs> two. Um, no, I don't have any experience with this thing. I don't think anybody does. I don't think they <laughs> sold any of them. <laughs> I, Did I you see the commercial? I <laughs> No, I, I don't have any first second experience with the with the actual Magnavision. My only experience with Laserdisc in general was uh, one of my dad's friends um, had it, and his main thing was he liked to pause it and look at the still images because it was so much clearer than VHS, which was the only alternative. It's just time. true. Yeah, true. Uh, I, so yeah, that that and uh, I think my debate coach husband he he had a Laserdisc player, but had a DVD player too because that's that's where we were by the time. So oh, okay, the yeah. Laserdisc player wasn't getting a whole lot of use by then. So my third grade teacher, uh, Mr. Marciano, uh, had a Laserdisc player, um, and every about once a year he would invite a select group of students. And I know it all sounds very weird, but um, he would invite a select group of students to his house to watch Dragon Slayer, the movie Dragon Slayer, mm -hmm. I think is what it was. It was the one with the, I, I don't even remember who was in it, the blonde guy, and he creates a shield out of the, the scales and stuff. It's not a very good movie, but it was on Laserdisc. Yep. And and we would all go to his house, me and like like his top students from that year, whatever that was, Uh and we would go to his house and watch this movie. And there would be a parent there. It wasn't like we shipped off. Uh, there would be a parent there with us. And we'd watch this movie with them. And we'd have popcorn. And that's about all I remember of it. But all I remember was thinking, wow, you have to turn the disc over. Halfway through. You sure do. Halfway through the movie. Just like an LP. Wow. And I, I, I just, I was, I, I was sitting there watching this this commercial with my with my sons and my middle son uh says to me i and I, I said to him oh yeah i'm like oh yeah you had to turn the disc over to see that happen he goes how could you not get a movie on that entire the one side of that entire disc? look at how big it is i'm like yep. it's so big it's like it was a different technology <laughs> see we didn't have the stuff we have now so no i have no experience with that though i do have a slightly creepy story about laser disc aj on twitter AJ uh, asks, I, I, this question just baffles me. TV choices. Uh -huh. For HDR Gaming, he wants to know, TCL 6 Series or Vizio P Series? 
Yeah. So this is about latency, and I don't know the answer to the latency question about these two TVs. Yeah, well, we haven't seen reviews of the new Vizio P series yet because I don't I don't think they've come out yet. Um, so yeah, well, yeah, so they were available to buy, but I haven't seen reviews of the Vizio P series yet. So I don't know what its latency is. I do know the one difference that is potentially something that gamers would care about, which is the TCL 6 series uses a 60 hertz panel. Okay. And the Vizio P series uses a 120 hertz panel. That should make a difference right there. And the old Vizio P series uh, could accept a 1080p resolution, but 120 hertz signal from, say, a computer playing games. And now the Xbox One X can output 1080p at 120 hertz. So if you want 120 hertz, the TCL 6 series isn't going to give that to you. But if you only want 60 hertz, ugh, that is tough. I mean, uh, they're pretty darn comparable. The Vizio P series supposed to be a bit brighter, supposedly. That's what they're claiming. Again, haven't seen the reviews yet, so we're not All actually right. sure. In most other ways, they're very comparable. So uh, yeah, yeah that, that's a tough choice. Um, the TCL 6 series, if you don't care about the 120 hertz going to be less expensive it has very low latency it's really good at particularly for its price but even bar none it's it's really good so if the money counts more than 120 hertz go six series from TCL. so what about that tcl six series or the sony x 900 e he asks secondarily i mean i just go tcl six series all the way in that comparison because the mm -hmm. the 900 e had way fewer dimming zones it had like 40 versus 120 in the tcl six series uh no dolby vision on the x 900 e uh there is dolby vision on the tcl six series it's very similar peak light output for hdr um again i think that sony was a 120 hertz although i I don't think it accepted a 120 hertz signal. I think it was just the panel. I would right. have to look that up. But here I'm I'm leaning towards TCL 6 series no matter what versus the X900E just because the more local dimming zones and the Dolby Vision by itself is reason enough in my opinion. Jonathan, the people making soundtracks for disc releases, streaming, and TV shows can't know ahead of time what sort of sound system will be used to play back their content. So what are they even aiming for? Is it similar to music mastering where they're trying to make it sound okay even on the crappiest speakers? Are they trying to make a movie sound like it did in the movie theater, but for some arbitrary smaller room size, arbitrarily smaller room size? Or are they just doing the bare minimum to get the thing out the door? <laughs> so basically, the soundtracks, like how are these things mixed? Um yeah, this would be a really great question for Clint because I haven't. Mm. Clint's actually done mixing for movies before, mm -hmm. and if I had thought that we were going to get fifteen deep into this thing, I might have shot him an email. <laughs> but um, yeah, see, I think it's going to depend on the person who's doing the mixing, and that's clearly the case when you look at the differences between some and between the, the movies. budget and amount of time they've been given. Well, that could be true, true as well. But oh, yeah. I mean, if you look at the the actual transfers that we've seen you look at thor ragnarok which yeah. is kind of garbage and there's no reason for it to be it just is <laughs> it's disney uh, they've they've got a little bit of money they, some of their movies have, have made some money some of their theme parks and merchandise has made some money they could have maybe had spent another twenty dollars on this thing and it would have been a lot better could have been. and then you look at other transfers that are you know have no right to be as good as they are um john you know, wick <laughs> exactly great sound on that Fantastic sound. So, what, where, you know, what, what's the difference? You know, it could be just the the per, you know, like like Rob said, how much time they were given, how, what was the budget, who was doing it, what was their experience level? You know, uh, <laughs> can they grasp the concept of objects versus channels? Which we, talked, we about talked about last, about last week. week. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of things that kind of go into this, and but I think the uh, the equipment is kind of what he's kind of getting at here. Sure. And most of these uh, these studios are equipped with different setups so that you yeah. can hear it in different ways. Yeah. So you get you know uh, a, a good smattering of what people are going to be experiencing, and I'm. I, there's a temptation when you've got good speakers to think that they must be mixing it for the lowest common denominator. Mm. But the fact is, if you make a something that sounds good on a good speaker, the people who have the bad speakers, it sounds just fine to them. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's it's not they they're just missing up. They, you know, they're just missing the high end stuff. It's not a, or the low end stuff. They're mi or the mid stuff if you're a Bose. You know, they <laughs> you know they're missing a lot of stuff, but. 
you know, you just have to make sure if you have everything sounding good on good speakers, it's going to sound good. On, it's gonna, it's not like you're going to put on bad speakers and like, oh, I can't hear anything now. No, <laughs> it's just you will be missing some sounds and it will not sound as good. It won't have as much dynamic range. It won't have as much bass. It won't have as much highs. It won't have as much detail. It won't have as much clarity. But that's what you always had when you had bad speakers. So, you know, I don't think that they, I think what they would they do is they mix on what they're familiar with mm -hmm. and then they check it out on, uh, on crappier speakers to say, just to make sure that something they did didn't make it sound <laughs> completely, you know, weird on those speakers. From, from from my knowledge, most of the studios have a, a small dubbing stage that they use for their home mixes. Um, so it's not the full-size dubbing stage of the theater. Now, like in Sony's case, they go into basically a full-size dubbing theater, but they have two speaker setups. They have one that's the full theater-sized arrangement and then another set of speakers on rigging that's physically closer. So they have a, a much bigger room than most people would have, but they have the speakers physically closer. I've heard the one of the Sony guys talking about that right. when, when Home Theater Geeks podcast was backing around. So it can be different from studio to studio, but usually sure. they do have some kind of setup that they're using for their home mix, and it's a smaller form of a dubbing stage or at least speakers physically closer to them. And that, that seems to be what they use. Jonathan came across a product called the Aftermaster Pro. It's an HDMI pass-through device that goes in between the source and your TV or sound system and claims to increase volume, improve dialogue intelligibility, and reduce loud special effects and background noises. Any idea what it's actually doing to the signal? Is it just another dynamic uh, volume compression option? Uh, I, I swear I didn't click on this. I did not think ah. we were going to get this deep into this thing. So I'm, click, <laughs> I'm, I'm clicking on it right now. Uh, Try adjusting your TV audio to hear the dialogue. Okay. Yep. Yep. <laughs> already, not, You've already sold me on me not wanting this. So, <laughs> yeah. This sounds just like a, an EQ that you're going to be putting into your system that's going to boost the frequencies of... Uh, where normal human voices and yep. uh, maybe roll off everything else, which is great if you have absolutely garbage speakers. Yeah, oh, you know and they're aiming it for the built-in TV speakers or a cheap sound bar. So yeah. I don't, I don't begrudge that. Yeah, but and this is this is exactly this is exactly the point, right? Exactly the point here, which is if you have good speakers, you don't need this. That's right. If you have good speakers, you're going to hear the 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 mix as it was intended to be if you have bad speakers then you're going to have problems and th this might be a solution to the problems the real solution it's to a, the problem is to have good stuff. speakers yeah yeah i mean this <laughs> this thing is not cheap what is it 200 or 250 dollars you can buy good speakers for that you could buy you could if you're using tv speakers you could buy a a, a decent sound bar oh yeah you could buy a couple of computer, yeah. Uh, compu yeah, exactly, or a couple of computer speakers that you just plug into the to the RCA inputs. Okay, on hundred and eighty bucks, so almost two hundred dollars. Whatever, dude. You can get, uh, you could totally for give me two hundred dollars. I I get you so that you can understand the dialogue. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'm. Yeah, I, so just listening to their examples, uh, it certainly sounded like they were applying some EQ. So they're yeah. they're boosting up the mid range for sure, the vocal range, which reasonable enough thing to do uh and then yeah they're applying some dynamic compression to the uh to the volume there i i wish more places were using dolby volume because that's my favorite of the uh adjustable dynamic compression things i don't i haven't but, seen uh, dolby volume in a long yeah time. anthem that's the best place to get that mm, but those are cheap <laughs> uh chris chris has an update Chris was a guy who was helping his friend install a theater in her oddly shaped basement. They ended up installing all in-wall and in ceiling speakers with acoustically transparent screen mounted flush on the wall where her TV used to be rather than uh, using a motorized screen and having it come down in front of the alcove area to the right, which is what we suggested. At the end of it all, she loves her new theater, but was really in that. So that is what really matters. But Chris does have one big complaint. To fit within the budget, we recommended an elite screens Acoustic Pro UHD projection screen. While it performs just fine now that you got it all figured out, it was an absolute worst to put together and to <laughs> deal with. The Edge Free screen says that it comes with an optional half-inch bezel. You have to Velcro the screen material itself. Uh, and to get the full screen size, you have to leave that bezel off. So it's either give up some screen size to have a bezel to absorb it, the tiny amount of overshoot or have a white edge all the way around to keep the, the full screen size. 
Chris's bigger complaint is that the instructions never warned to place the nuts that hold the center uh, support bar into the frame before piecing everything together. So when it came time to put that center bar in, he wound, uh, wound up having to basically disassemble what he had done. Then he discovered that the pressure of the middle of the frame is so strong that instead of the center support holding the frame perfectly square, the frame actually bows the center support. Yeah. He called the customer service and they said they hear that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's encouraging. Good thing you guys are making some changes over there. And their solution was to tell him to order missing parts on the website to get an additional set of wall brackets to hold both the top and the bottom of the frame on the wall so that it makes it flush again. Yeah. For some reason, they couldn't put in an order for the parts for him while he was on the phone. I want to take one second right there to stop. Yeah. And just address that one little piece. And that is this. I have worked for so many companies where integrated systems between sales and shipping and all this other stuff is a non entity just doesn't exist i understand your frustration mm -hmm. in them not being able to do it for you but i have been working for a company where when you fill something out online it prints out and then we have to take that print out and write it onto a separate piece of paper which then gets entered back into the computer. The huh. same computer that we got <laughs> the initial printout from. Okay. That's, and not only that, we didn't have to call you to get additional information that we never asked you at the beginning part of it. Uh -huh. So them not being able to do that does not surprise me. Irritating for you, I know, especially everything else you've gone through, yeah. but let's not hold that against them. Let's hold it against the company in general for having stupid systems. Uh, but, you know, a lot of that take, costs a lot of money to do and clearly not spending it on their frames. Why would they spend it on their infrastructure? Finally, there's an uh, optional uh, bla uh, black backing to prevent light bleed through the acoustically transparent screen, but it's basically held on by paper clips. And the instructions state that use a clip at every marking on the frame, but there were 98 markings, only 59 clips included. So when he went to hang the screen, a bunch of those clips fell off. So <laughs> all in all... Going with elite screens ended up causing a lot of delays and headaches, and he wished he'd gone with a less expensive silver ticket screen since putting the one he owns together and hanging it, it was so much easier. So we do have a picture of it, and it does look very nice on the wall. It looks very nice. The finished product looks looks great. So, yeah. So, so here's another person telling us not so happy with elite screens, albeit the very final product happy with it. Right. But it was a lot of hassle and way more delays and headaches than expected to get there. So I'm glad she moved her couches back, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was a big problem at the very beginning. So everything looks good. It looks really. Oh, good. I like. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm sure she is happy with the finished product. It looks really clean and cool. I mean, it looks great. Yeah, you, you can't even see where the the speakers are. You know, in the front yeah, of the barely. room. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, because they're behind the screen. They're behind yeah. the screen. It just looks amazing. Mm -hmm. Uh, so back in Chris's own theater, he's ready to install Atmos speakers. The room is 14 by 19 by seven and a half, which is about the same size of my room. And he has two rows of seats at 11 and 16 feet from the screen. Okay. Uh, he prefers to sit in the front row while his wife prefers to sit in the back row. So he cares about the sound in both rows. He bought the four. That's really a problem. But he brought the he bought uh, four of the outdoor speaker depot uh, MK650 insulin speakers. So where would we recommend positioning them so both rows get good Atmos sound? Although he definitely favored the front row if that's the only way to determine the best speaker placement. Okay, so he sits eleven. Eleven from the screen. And it's nineteen. So you would normally put it five feet back from you if you're doing top rears. Which would be directly above the back row. Right. Would the the ceiling is actually a little bit closer to you, which means you would actually have them a little bit forward of that because it's usually eight-foot ceilings that we're talking about. Right. So having it seven and a half means that that angle, the speaker would be even a little bit closer to you than that. Right. Yeah, maybe four or four and a half feet or something. Yeah. What does he have? What's how how he's gonna, he's putting Atmos speakers in, but what does yep. he have currently? Seven point what do we know or five point? Is it five oh, point? I'm not. Uh, I don't know if it's five or seven for the floor level. But I, either way, aren't you just gonna go a little bit in front of the front row and a little bit behind the back row? I, I would probably do something like that. Yeah. 
I mean, if you really wanted to, if he was going to be neurotic about it, you could, if he doesn't have surround back speakers, he could put top, I mean, rear heights in like top middles or something like it's that. It's not as and, though the rear heights play what the surround backs would have, though. Like, yeah. They're getting different but sounds. I'm, that is true. But if he's got surround backs and and he doesn't have a ton of space behind that uh, yeah couch, about so. three feet three feet from yeah. the rear row to the back wall yeah so yeah just a little bit so just a like where your knees would be maybe a little bit in front of that uh and then just behind your wife's head yeah not reclined if she reclines that's her business she wants to mess up the side by reclining that's her business yeah no i put them like a foot in front of the front row and like a foot behind the back row and call them top fronts and top rears that's right He's heard us disagree about what color, what about the best color to paint the walls and ceiling. This is a fully dedicated theater. So, what's a recommendation, and what about carpet color? Well, I mean, go to a movie theater uh -huh. and look around. That's what you should do. <laughs> I guess a lot of them have a lot of them use a dark blue. Yeah, a I lot of dark, them do, or dark, dark blue, red. Dark blue, dark red, probably because that's cheap. But uh, you could do grays, dark do gray. You know, do gray. Do gray. I. You know, hey, if this is a fully dedicated theater and your wife doesn't care and blah, 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 it is depressing to walk into a dark gray room. Really? In the middle of the day. It is. You it's think? weird. I don't think so. Without highlights. Because I mean, then maybe, you're, maybe completely black. That then you're, what, you gonna, what is he going to do with the ceiling? He's going to leave the ceiling white? Oh no 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 heavens no no black black ceiling and gray walls is what See? I would go for. That's where you that's where I that's where, to me that's where you run into problems. It just becomes oppressive in there. But if black you're okay with is all like that, not having a ceiling, it just goes on forever. I'm just gonna stare at you until you stop saying stuff like that because it's not <laughs> true. I remember, uh, and I, I I think I've said this before in this podcast, watching an HGTV thing with somebody had a dedicated theater. It was it was all black. It was the gray walls and black ceiling, and they thought it was a dungeon. They were like, I wonder what they were doing in here. But like, if you have a were watching movies at the front, you can idiots. Tell. That's what. Yeah. So whatever. I'm just telling you, it's if I'd, you you can make it look good, you can make it look good, and I'm sure it'll be fine. But yes, he's right. Black ceiling gray make the the whole thing black whatever but uh it doesn't really matter i mean yeah. when it comes down to it you're going to turn the lights off which you don't want is stuff reflecting so dark colors are better than non-glossy colors are better yeah i mean so, i don't like going for pure matte finish because that is so easy to mark like if you brush you're worried the, about that sleeve <laughs> against it oh yeah no it's pure matte is annoying so i go eggshell you know, one 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 step up in the glossiness thing of the finish. I'd go eggshell finish. And uh, Sherwin-Williams is the paint company to go to because they have... So just go to Sherwin-Williams, ask for the gray screen because that is a completely neutral gray. Mm -hmm. It's just called gray screen. And then they have all the various lighter and darker shades that they all have different names, but that family of gray of which gray screen is one of them. Cause it's easy to remember gray screen from Sherwin Williams. Cause you're going for gray. And then they have all the darker shades. If you want darker than that. Yeah. All right. Uh, I have not watched these videos from Damien. So okay. there's none of that going to happen. And I'm looking at the rest of these things. And they're all pretty short and we can answer them next week. All right. So that's going to be it for this week. Oh, we put oops. a dent in it. That's good. We did. So who do we have left, Rob? We have Damien and Michael I and Paul T. And I think that's it, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. That is it. All right. We want to thank our listeners of the week. We want to thank Miguel and Chris for uh, giving us a donation at www.avrant.com by clicking on the cup of coffee link and giving us a PayPal donation. Thank you, Miguel, and thank you, Chris. Yeah, Miguel, Chris, thank you very much for those donations. We want to thank you that we have an up to $300 matching donation challenge for this week, the week of May 7th through May 14th, 2018. If you donate during this week... One of our listeners, the first $100 will be give anonymous, the second $100 will be matched by James, the third $100 will be matched by Deepon. We'll be so up to $300 match, which means $600 for the podcast, which means that we will have lots of money to pay for hosting fees for the next and other things for the next couple of months. So thank you very much for all who intend to do that. And thank you, uh, uh, Anonymous, James, and Deepon. 
Yeah, for sure. Anonymous James Deepon, thanks very much for setting up that whole match pledge idea. And yeah, if, if, if you're hearing this within the week of May 7th through 14th, and you were thinking, yeah, I can throw those guys a buck or two, that'd be fantastic. We would appreciate it, because your dollar becomes two, and your two dollars becomes four. And uh, lastly, we want to thank our patrons over at Patreon uh, for donating and kind of their continued support. So thank you very much, gentlemen and ladies. Yeah, patreon.com slash podcast. Thank you very much to our 59 patrons. And Aiden and Miguel for talking us up to Rhythmic and to Accessories for Less and Oppo, respectively. So thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, Aiden, Miguel, thanks very much again, and congratulations on those purchases. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.